right, welcome. And thanks for coming to using cross laminated timber um, in the Pacific Northwest, um, a presentation on uh, the CLT. Um, my name is Dan Ciani. I'm a senior geotechnical engineer with GeoEngineers. Um, first, I'd like to just start out and see, you know, who has used CLT on one of a project here recently. Is anybody considering using it in the future here? Okay. All right. Um, so cross laminated timber is um, a type of mass timber construction. Um, it's basically um, structural lumber stacked crosswise, glued together. Um, you know, you can change that configuration to get various structural capacities out of it. You know, it was used quite a bit. It began use in the 1990s in Austria and Germany. Um, it definitely has become more and more popular over the years, especially in other parts of Europe and Canada. Um, really just recently, it's starting to become more and more popular. Um, and there's a lot more interest in the, the United States. Um, there's some definite advantages with the CLT, um, you know, over, um, Constru um, other construction materials such as uh, steel and concrete, you know, it definitely has a sustainability factor. Um, you've also got, you know, the modularity of it um, and the ease of building with it. Um, so it's a, it can be a good alternative uh, to some of the other typical materials. Um, you know, I've uh, surveyed a few folks um, in the development community and, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in the CLT. I just don't think there's, um, you know, some people are, uh, there's a lot of questions, I guess, still being asked on, um, you know, where is it applicable? Where is the code at? And really the intent of this presentation is to provide, um, you know, some information to that, to answer some of those questions. Also give, you know, the audience here to ask some pointed questions to uh, the presenters as well. So um, I'll jump into uh, introducing the presenters and some of the topics that they'll cover, and then we'll, we'll get into it. So we have Logan Rasmussen. He's a uh, structural engineer with GLR. They have offices in uh, the Boise and Spokane. He has over 13 years of experience. Uh, recently, Logan designed a CLT project in uh, Spokane, utilizing the CLT panels for a uh, 9,600 square foot fitness center. Um, he'll be discussing the CLT performance benefits, connections, you know, some of the design help that may be out there, um, construction and erection of the CLT panels, as well as an overview of his recent project. Then Ethan Martin, he's the uh, regional, Northwest Regional Director with the U.S. Woodworks Program. Ethan provides support and resources for architects, engineers, and contractors. He is a licensed engineer and had his own firm before uh, joining Woodworks in 2011. Ethan will be presenting on, you know, current code, some of the fire resistance, building types, design hurdles, as well as benefits of uh, CLT. Then Dr. Dolan. He's a professor and director of codes and standards at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Washington State University. He has a, held a Fulbright Fellowship in 2008 and conducted research on design and construction of residential buildings to better survive earthquakes in uh, Chile at the Universidad de Concepcion. He also has advised the Chilean government and forestry in industry on how to update design codes and standards. Dr. Dolan will be dis discussing the state of the practice CLT performance and testing and where it will be going in the future, what some of the opportunities that the testing will provide, um, what WSU is cur currently involved with, and some of the certification uh, involvement and design processes. And then Russ Vangen is the founder and C CEO of Vangen Timbers, which produces timber products, including CLT and glue lambs. Russ has leadership roles with the Timber Products Manufacturing Association, uh, Northeast Washington Forestry Coalition, and Sustainable Northwest. He writes about the industry for Timber Processing Magazine, as well as his own blog, and he is involved in policy. 
Russ will be presenting on sustainability of CLT, how it is produced and benefits of CLT, and some of the hurdles. Um, you know, really the, the presentations, each uh, presenter will have about 30 to 40 minutes to present. We'll give a few minutes um, for a couple of questions after each presentation um, before the next presenter um, steps up. And then at the very end, we really want to open it up to, you know, to the audience to ask some, uh, some pointed questions if, uh, you know, something didn't get covered in one of the presentations. So um, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, our first speaker will be Logan Rasmussen. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dan Chiani and Dio Engineers for uh, moderating and putting this event together, hosting, and appreciate all you guys have done so far. And thanks for everybody for coming out today, spending a little time with us. Um, hopefully, I can help you learn a, bit, a little bit about CLT and share with you my experience. Um, my name is Logan Rasmussen. I'm with GLR Engineers. We're a private structural engineer. And um, we have offices in Spokane and Boise. Um, I want to cover a couple topics with you guys. And the co topics I want to cover is going to be some of the codes where you can find CLT, um, find a little bit about it and where it's at, um, cover what the PRG 320 is. You'll hear a lot about that today. Um, some of the structural uses for CLT. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about gravity and lateral, some of the areas of excellence and some of the areas of issues with it. Um, I want to touch on connections, show you some of the typical connections you can use. And next, construction and erection, um, working with some of the manufacturers. And then we want to tell you a little bit about our experience with CLT, um, followed by some lessons learned and some design help options out there. Uh, to start off, um, 2015 IBC, um, you can use CLT in areas of type 3, 4, and 5 construction. Um, type 3 and 5, where you have your non-combustible materials, you can use it the same as you would any other wood material. If you're going to go into type 4 construction, it's covered in heavy timber. Um, what it's going to tell you in there is it's going to cover your exterior walls. It's going to tell you they need to be covered by one of the following, fire treated, gypsum, and non or non-combustible. Um, if you're going to use it for a floor, they're going to tell you they want at least a four inch thick panel. Um, it needs to be mechanically fastened and supported at all of its supports. And if you're going to use it for a roof panel in type four, they want it to be at least a three inch thick panel. Um, next, if you move on to the NDS, um, it's a pretty short and sweet section. It's chapter 10. It's only four pages long, I believe. And the points to remember here is that what they're going to tell you is for your design values, they're basic. Oh, it's a little small. I'm sorry. It's going to tell you you need to reference the manufacturers um, for the values you're going to use. Um, another point to consider is for the service conditions, they're going to tell you right now it's used for dry service conditions only. Um, had lots of people ask me if you can use it for exposed conditions. Um, it's a really cool product. Can we expose it and leave it exposed um, uh, you know, to the weather and whatnot? People do it with glue lamps, with other wood. But the answer that I've always come across is no. Every manufacturer that I've talked to, to <coughs> thinks it's a fantastic idea. In theory, it would look beautiful, but they're going to tell you no, they won't warranty it for that. So as of now, I haven't come across anybody that will let you use it for exposed conditions, which I think is probably a very good thing. So, we're freezing up here. There we go. Uh, next is the CLT handbook. Because the NDS is so short and it's not really covering the structural properties, of CLT is not going to tell you how to design for connections, for gravity, for lateral. What they do is you're going to turn to the CLT handbook. And this is really kind of the Bible for CLT right now. Um, it's not just for the structural guys. It's for architects. It's for contractors. It's for everybody. And the way it lays out is the first couple sections is really a good read for everybody. It's going to cover all the basics, what it is, how you use it. The next five chapters are going to cover um, sections for engineers. 
It's going to cover your arc connections. It's going to cover gravity, lateral, and a few other topics. Um, followed by four sections that are really geared towards architects. It's covering fire. It's covering sound. Um, and it's covering a few other sections. The last section is geared towards contractors, which is handling and erection. Um, and next is the PRG 320. What, what this is and what the code's telling you is the manufacturers have to follow the PRG 320. And what it is, it's your performance rated cross laminate timber standard. Um, for the manufacturer, what that means is it's going to talk to them about performance criteria. What they have to meet is a minimum, and it's going to talk to them um, about your quality assurance and what is that one now? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I qualifications. Can't do that. So it's your qualifications, yeah. right? Thank you. Um, some other sections at the end are pretty good. It's going to tell you a little bit about the properties of it. It's going to have your E-series and your B-series. Your E-series of CLT is your machine, machine stress rated lumber. It's your higher grade materials. Um, and then the B-series, your visually graded lumber. It's just like you would typical two by framing. It's a visually graded. It's a little lower quality, a little, little better cost. Um, for me, I was kind of surprised we're from Spokane. We typically see dug for larch as our common building material over there. So I kind of expected that to be the typical material. But what I found is um, for economy and the typical that they're producing is the B2, which is your spruce pine fir. That seemed to be pretty common throughout the different manufacturers that I spoke with. However, um, one important thing I would mention is it's very important to talk to your manufacturers. Everybody does th things a little different their sizes, their thickness, um, and how they produce. So it's very important to talk with those guys. Um, as far as uses for CLT, you've got your different building elements that you can use it. You can use it as roof plates, floor plates, wall plates, cores, and shafts. Um, as far as the building types, it's really all of them, but the primary uses you're seeing them in right now would be residential, multifamily, commercial, and some educational. Um, but really, anywhere you can use wood, this is a good application, as well as moving into some areas outside of wood where it's performing and, and um, competing with concrete. Um, some of the typical construction methods are same as the other wood, where it's platform framed or balloon framed. Um, you have the typical things to think about when you're, when you're platform framing as far as shrinkage or anything like that. Next is some of the gravity and lateral areas of excellence. Um, and the gravity, one of the ways it performs well is it's got a lower material weight, yet it's very comparable strengths to the to equivalent concrete thicknesses, um, which is really a game changer when you come to thinking of floor plates, wall plates. If you can go lighter and similar strengths, you've really got some, some advantages there. Um, the, the thing about the way they make your panels when they're laminated in 90 degrees <coughs> is you now have two directional span capabilities. You have a major and minor axis, um, which opens up some fun things you can do with it. If you're, if you're architects, you want some cantilevers or maybe some two-way overhangs. Um, the other thing it does when you stack at 90 degrees to each other is you become dimensionally stable in, in two directions. As wood wants to shrink, perpendicular grain, when you're stacking them in two directions, you now have two directions that it doesn't want to shrink. Um, the shock fabrication aspect of CLT is an interesting one. Um, you're, you're really eliminating the amount of time you spend out in the field building with the material. You don't have to have a framing crew. You don't have to have the number of framing crew people. Um, you're not fighting the weather concerns. You're able to build through the, the nasty rainy season or our spring where we're fighting um, wet, cold, snow, all those kind of things. It's all done in the shop, comes out to the site <coughs> in large pieces which go together very quickly. Um, along with that become, comes the minimal manpower and experience it takes to install it. Um, a lot of times you're able to install this stuff depending on the job with a crane operator and two to three people. 
doing this stuff. And they're putting together with fairly unskilled labors, so to speak, and simple methods such as screw guns, nails, um, your typical wood connections. So this is all adds up to, to faster erection times when you're putting it together <coughs> when, confer when compared to uh, stick frame construction. Um, so your shortened schedules, penalized construction, and the other thing to keep in mind is it's just wood. You know, there's, it, it's nothing new, it's not a new material, it's, it's all wood. It still goes together with the similar connections we've always used, nails, screws, bolts, those kind of things. Um, laterally, it's got some really great properties for diaphragm and shear wall uses. It's, it's extremely strong. Um, again, it goes together with your typical wood connections. Um, they are working on future testing and further development in these areas, <coughs> which you'll also see on the next slide. That's one of the drawbacks to it. Um, the other great you know, aspect that comes for lateral is your lighter weight. Um, you know, if, if you're here in seismic, seismically higher regions, um, your seismic forces are dependent upon your weight, so your seismic forces may be going down, depending on how you use your lateral system. Um, you, you're gonna see this ripple effect through in your footing weights, as, as well as your crane size. Um, to me, that's a big one that, that really does get talked about a lot, is the weight of the panels is relatively light compared to concrete, and not only seismic weight, but I think construction-wise, that's a smaller crane to pick it, um, it's, it's quicker time just to put pieces together so you're, you have the crane on site for less time. And you can put it on your slab relatively easily, where some of the bigger cranes require thicker slabs, more reinforcing. These are pretty small cranes, and you can get away with minimal reinforcing and slab thicknesses. Um, some of the issues in those two areas would be for gravity, you're, it, it's a new product and we're fairly limited right now with design guides. The CLT handbook's a great reference and resource for us right now, but we don't have dozens of design guides. It hasn't been around for ages, so it, it's fairly new there, and the resources are somewhat limited. Um, your panels do not accept, um, and the interesting part about the panels for gravity is it, the PRG320, which is the, talks about how your panels need to be manufactured. Um, your panels aren't composite in the in-plane bending or the header condition. If you're using them for wall panels and you have a big wall opening, um, you have a big point load above that opening, you're not getting composite action in the panels because of the way they're glued together. There's requirements that, that tell you you have to glue them between layers, but between pieces in each layer, they don't have to be glued. So you're not getting the composite action. So that's something to be aware of, something to pay attention to. Um, the other issues for gravity is, you know, this, and it's really not just gravity, it's CLT as a whole. People seem to be a little hesitant to use it. They don't want to be the first to design with it. Um, they want somebody else to kind of figure out the pitfalls first and walk through it. Um, we're running into, when I bring it up to people, they have, they have areas of concerns for cost and availability. They don't want to, they're afraid it's too expensive. They don't want to send it out. They're afraid the contractors don't know how to build with it that they're gonna artificially raise their prices because they've never done it before. So there's a little fear there to use it and be the first to use it. Um, laterally, you have some of the same issues where there's a lack of design guides. Um, and in fact, for diaphragms, I'm under the understanding that there's no real full-scale test performed to back up some of this stuff. There's a lot of good methodologies of how to design diaphragms and design guides and white papers for it, but Really, to date, there's no true test for it that I understand. Um, laterally, the shear walls, they are very strong, but that's also a drawback in how you address ductility issues. Um, how do you make the failure become ductile before the wood splinters and it's a brittle failure? So there's ongoing research on that, which I think we'll hear a lot more about today. Um, one of the other issues for lateral is, you know, manufacturers need to meet the PRG320 to get your gravity capacities that we use to design with, but the other thing to consider is lateral capacities, if you're gonna use it for a shear wall or a diaphragm. Um, some, pliers, some suppliers do not have ICC acceptance for their diaphragm and shear wall values, 
So make sure you're talking with your supplier up front to make sure you're using the right panels that have this acceptance criteria and using those values. The other thing I think we're going to hear about a lot more today by another speaker is going to be jurisdictional acceptance. Um, when we did our first project, we were fairly nervous that um, even Spokane would accept it. We didn't, you know, it's, it's new to them, it's all in the codes, it's legit and it's there, but it's the first one. What kind of questions or concerns are we going to raise with this? And especially around here where you have higher seismic zones, how do you deal with this and is the jurisdiction going to accept it? What kind of hurdles are there? Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about connections, show you some of the typical connections. A lot of these are right out of the CLT handbook, um, but really don't, don't stop here. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can do connections. Be creative. It's wood. Um, you're really not limited to using what's in the CLT handbook for connections. But that being said, I'll show you some of the standard ones that they recommend and that they, they will walk through there in the CLT handbook. Um, for panel panels, whether it's wall panels or floor plates, there's a couple standard connections you can use. A half lap, where you're gonna put a half lap in each panel. Um, some of the benefits of that is your capacity you're gonna get with it. Also, when it comes to some of your fire ratings, it's gonna help conceal some of your connections. Um, some of the drawbacks to it, it's more expensive. Every time you cut a half lap out of a panel, you're wasting it, and you're shrinking your panel by that dimension, so there's some loss there. Um, some of the, and then the next connection type is a spline. So there's a surface spline and there's an internal spline for an option. Um, your surface spline is probably the cheapest and most common that I've seen. Um, what, what they do is they route out a layer on the outer spline, on the outer surface, and you're gonna put in a wood spline here. This could be some structural composite lumber, it could be plywood, there's various ways you can do it. And you're gonna screw it and or nail it together. Um, the, the other drawback of that, of course, is that it's exposed. If it's at, um, let's say you do that on an interior face of wall, it's exposed, you gotta deal with it. Floors, it works really well <coughs> because you can put it on top of your floor. If you're gonna put down flooring, gyp creek, something like that, it's gonna hide and cover. Um, another option would be an internal spine, spline. Um, you're not wasting material at the end. You, you have the same cutout that you're gonna do for an exterior spline, but it takes a little more craftsmanship and, and time to put that piece together. Um, panel intersections might be walls to floor plates, might be wall corners, where um, some of the typical connections here are gonna be face brackets where two pieces come together. You can do some internal brackets where this is knifed into the adjoining member. Um, again, it can help with fire concerns where your connection is hidden within the wall. Um, you can also do um, sort, of, sort of wood keyways where you're going to route out one of the members, put a wooden keyway in there. And then the other way is that makes a lot of sense to me is just an exterior connection where you're just screwing the two pieces together. Some of the things to think about there, if you're a structural guy, is when you're putting these connections together, you can't be screwing into the end grain of some of the layers. You need to be conscious of what layers you're screwing into. Um, foundation connections. Um, much like a tilt-up panel might look, you can do a side plate connection where you're gonna connect the panel to the foundation. Or the other option they have is, um, again, kind of a wood keyway where you can put down pressure treated wood member, sit it on top, you can have connections on the inside. Um, really these are just a couple suggestions. That's kind of the fun part about this product. There's lots of different ways you can do it. There's not just these two ways. Um, something to think about though is as you set this panel down, you have the interface of the moisture barrier there you need to deal with, same as any other lumber. They don't recommend that you set this right on there. You need to pay attention to that as well as um, thinking through when you put a CLT panel down that's going to be cut so straight and so flat, how do you interface with that with a material like a cast in place concrete that, that has waves and sweeps to it? It's not, it's not perfectly flat. How do you deal with that? Um, so there's in, some interesting challenges there to, to consider when you put those together. This, personally, I found it very helpful to have a contractor on board where 
from the beginning on, on the project where we could talk this through, bounce ideas off each other, and come up with a good solution that we thought was going to work. Um, also, there's hybrid connections. You know, CLT doesn't just have to play with CLT. You can mix in conventional framing with it. You can put CLT floor plates on stick frame walls, vice versa. You can put in I joists, conventional floors. Uh, you can put in trusses in the floors. This slide just shows um, platform frame construction, but of course you can do balloon frame construction where you end up putting a ledger on the face too, connecting your floors in that way as well. Um, some things to remember with your connections, especially architecturally, might be things such as fire, air tightness, acoustics, and of course volume changes. Um, it is dramatically <coughs> stable in two directions. Um, there is some shrinkage, but more or less negligible. Um, but if you're going to platform frame, there's still those volume changes to think about. Basically, just all the, the typical wood stuff. Um, next topic I want to cover is construction and erection. Um, really, a good place to find this is Chapter 12 of the CLT Handbook. And this is really geared towards the contractors out there. Um, just means and methods. How does this stuff go together? How do you stand it? How do you erect it? How do you deal with shipping and handling? Um, and there's some great sources in the handbook. Um, but the other great source out there is going to be your CLT supplier, your manufacturer. If those guys have been doing this before. It's not their first rodeo. They have connections and contacts you can talk to. <coughs> they can usually give you some reference of who's done it before, help sell your nerves and, and walk you through how they may have done it before as well. Um, the other great thing about the manufacturer that I'd recommend you talk to them early on in the design process is everybody builds their panels different. Their widths, their thicknesses, their types of panels. Design your building around that to utilize it to the, the most um, for cost and construction sequencing. Um, you know, think, things to think about are going to be um, not only panel sizes, but also when it comes to construction. Think about your dimensional tolerance here. You know. Every panel isn't perfect. They all have tolerances that we need to count for. So how do we do that in the field? How do you deal with gaps? How do you deal with things that run long? Maybe they're not perfectly true or straight. Um, next would be shipping, storage, handling. Uh, it, the number of panels you can ship is kind of interesting due the, to the lighter weight than concrete. If you, if you think about precast construction, done in a plant that they ship out on a truck. Similar size panels, 10 foot widths maybe, uh, work well for shipping, yet they're extremely heavy when compared to these. These are about the third the weight of its equivalent size. So you can get a lot more pieces on a truck. Um, when they ship, a lot of times they're coming three panels per bundle. They're all pre-wrapped to help you from weather. But once you start to erect it, you gotta remember it is wood, it is exposed to weather. Um, it's not going to damage the material, but if you're going to leave it exposed and you want to see it, it can start to fade it. We actually noticed on our project from the time they started standing the first panels to the time we finished, those first ones had a slight different, slightly different coloration just from being in the sun so much. Um, so protecting it from weather is going to be pretty important if you're going to have exposed panels on the insides. Um, think through your site storage. Again, they're coming from a manufacturer. It's not like tilt where you need a giant slab. You don't have to be casting these. You don't need grass slabs. You don't have to stack them um, like tilt. But you do need a little bit of laydown area for them. And then picking prep is another thing to think about. Um, a lot of times, the supplier is pretty smart when they're sending your panels. If you have finished sides, the top two panels are going to come with the finished side down. The bottom panel comes with the finished side up. So when you pick it up with your forklift, you're not scratching the finished face. It's great, um, but talk to the supplier so you get them shipped in the right sequence, of course. Um, lifting and erection, they've got, uh, again, the CLT handbook's gonna come with a lot of great topics and cover a lot of different ways you can pick these panels. Um, you know, they come with different holes where you can do lifting slings. They come with um, screwed D-rings so you can screw in on site to pick them. There's, just a, there's a variety of different ways you can do it. A little bit of means and methods is what it really is. Um, and something other to think about is, is fit up not only panel to panel, but how they mix with your other materials. For example, if you've got steel columns, 
we had glue lamps beams coming into our panels how do you deal with making sure the fit up is right making sure all your notches are just perfect they need to come from the factory that way so you need to be making sure you're checking shop drawings to get all your elevations right um, as far as bracing there's a couple different types of bracing as far as wall panels go you could consider some larger pipe style bracing like you would tilt up and then I've also seen bracing where it's smaller stuff like just dimensional two by lumber you know, to get it for your bracing. Um, in, in our case, we ended up doing larger panels and our contractor opted to go with a larger pipe brace um, just for comfort level. Larger panels, similar wind loads that you'd see on your panels to a equivalent tilt up or anything like that. So we went with a little larger panel, but you know, another application is maybe you end up laying your panels you know, long and only 10 feet tall. Um, in applications like that, could you get away with wood? Quite possibly for your bracing, smaller, easier bracing. Um, then something to think about also is who designed your bracing? Um, is it better designed similar to tilt up might be? Or is the engineer a record covering this? Also something for the contractors to clean through when it comes to um, erection. And then um, some things we ran into is when is your bracing installed? Can you set this while it's sitting on the ground? Your bracing lift it up. So you're your bracings hanging off your panel similar to tilt or do you end up setting it up in the air and then working with your bracing later again that probably comes back to how you're using it what size this panels you're using um, something else to think about that we came across this is your bracing panel does your braces leave marks on your panels if you use the pipe bracing something we didn't think about was that when you put it up take them back off you know unscrew that there's just a little grease on all those pipe braces. They left little grease marks up there. Something to think about if it's going to be exposed. If it's not, no big deal. Um, some of the benefits for erection is that it's going together, like I said, with a small crew. Um, screw guns and such. Um, in our case, they had a crane operator and three field guys to put it all together. Um, it has a high level for speed of construction. I think when the job we worked on contractor told me when he got done and efficient set in his panels he was able to cycle in a, in a little less than 15 minutes a panel from laying on the ground to getting it put up um, so there's a lot of speed and repetition that way um, there's there's relatively simple wood connections you're not fighting the winter out the, the winter elements the outside elements um, and again the lighter crane make it really made it really nice to work with these panels Um, moving on to working with the manufacturers, um, there's a few useful things these guys are going to provide. They've got a lot of good design examples and design guides that they themselves have produced that are available to anybody out there. Um, everybody's going to have their span, default span table set up. These are going to be really handy for schematic level design when you don't need to fully design everything. They're just looking for generic spans and capabilities that you can use. Um, they're also going to be a great resource for construction and help. Um, they, they can also walk you through the shop drawing process. Um, what to expect, what they need to see from you to be able to cr produce shop drawings. A um, little different than any other wood material on the, as far as shop drawings go. You might liken it to a tilt-up job where they need to know each panel's dimension, each opening, everything right down to the nitty-gritty of them. Um, they're also going to help you understand the sizes of all the members they have, how they manufacture, the process they use, the efficiencies that you can get out of it if you design your panels right. And then also there's um, visually and non-visually graded panels, which comes down to if they're sanded or not. Uh, there's a little efficiency there to be used if they're, if they're non-visual and you don't have to sand them, of course. Um, some, some generic rules of thumb when you work with the manufacturers is um, to keep in mind for CLT is, so for your floor plates, you're gonna need bearing at each end, unless of course you can put columns all four corners, being that it's got two dimensional span capabilities, there's a chance you might not need beams. Um, it works well with other, with other hybrid systems, whether that's um, Lulam beams for support, steel beams, concrete, and the same goes for the lateral system. You can mix it in with other systems. Um, some good rules of thumb for the floors. 
Um, assuming you're going to do a two-inch dip creep topping on there for, for sound, fire, or anything like that, um, some good rules of thumb might be if you're doing a three-layer panel, and depending on if you're doing residential to assembly load, <coughs> my numbers look kind of backwards, but it's because if you look at residential, 40 PSF loads up to 100 PSF for assembly, here's, here, here's the rule of thumb for your spans. Three-layer, you're going to go anywhere from 11 feet down to 8 feet, depending on your loads. Five layers going to get you in a 14 to 15 foot span range, and a seven layer is going to be somewhere up 18 to 19 feet. Um, again, something to think about with your spans. You might be able to utilize a three span condition. Panels vary in lengths, but typically, maybe if you think 40 foot spans, 13 foot four inch works well for a three span condition. And if you're doing that, you're able to lay down up to 400 square feet of panel at a time. Um, if you're doing residential versus commercial, there's some things to consider here as far as picking out the panels you're going to use. They make a couple different types of panels. Some have interior layers. Oops. Some have interior layers that are um, number three and better, where the others are all number two and better. And one of the things to, to remember for the, for the designers is that if you're doing the number three and better layers, these layers have varying thicknesses. The outer layers are different than the inner layers. So as far as structural is concerned, your connections are different, how you design those connections when your bar layers vary in thickness. Um, commercial layers, number two and better, those are typically what I've seen, uniform layers. Um, and what, what you might be looking for on the residential stuff, a three layer series, 87 millimeter, a three and a half, a five layer series, which is uh, somewhere around the 139 millimeter, it meets five and a half. The nice thing about those is that you're meeting up with your conventional dimensioning for if you're mixing that with dimensional lumber. Um, if you're doing commercial, you're probably looking at whether it's a three, five, seven, or nine layer, you're looking at these kind of dimensions, 4.1, 6.9. Um, so little oddballs, numbers on the, the thicknesses there. But again, talk with your manufacturers. Everybody's slightly different. A five layer panel by one manufacturer is not the exact same dimensions as the next manufacturer. Um, next, I want to just tell you a little bit about our experience um, with CLT. Um, we, we got to work on a um, CrossFit Center up in Spokane, uh, single story, 9,600 square feet. We used five layer CLT wall panels, six and seven eighths inch thick. We had 38 panels, and they were up to 24 feet tall. Nice thing was our panels were only 4,000 pounds or less. Um, so, what that means is the entire job shipped on two trucks that came down from Canada. Um, and then what we did for the roof is we kind of treated it like you would a steel building, so to speak. We opened up the gym part. Um, we did trusses eight feet on center, used SIP panels to span those. And the whole theory there was that the contractor was able to do this with a very small crew. Um, as he would say, he, you know, just a couple of gorillas up there muscling things around and some fairly unskilled labor and did it very quickly. Um, for us, we ended up having 10 foot wide panels that we designed around. Um, the way that worked out is it worked well to accommodate up to six foot openings and a 10 foot panel still give us plenty of room for the jams on each end. Where we had larger openings, we used glue lamp headers instead of CLT panels. And then above that, we ended up doing a spandrel panel over the top. Um, structurally, that, that's what worked best, but also architecturally gave us a nice change in appearance. For the panels, we ended up doing holes and lifting loops. Uh, you simply pull out your lifting loops when you're done. It comes with a wood plug. Just pound in there when you're done, and it looks like it all grew together. Uh, they used pipe bracing, two pieces per panel, and we used some foundation brackets, two brackets per panel, kind of like you would do with a tilt-up. Um, and then the other thing we did is we ended up using a pressure tree to bottom plate um, like where, where we met up with the concrete foundation. Um, just some pictures of it. Again, this picture is just showing kind of our spandrel panel over the top where we have a girder load coming down. We ended up mixing in with the glue lamb. Glue lamb, six and three quarter inch, very similar to our six and seven inch panel thicknesses, so it, everything worked out well there. Um, a typical opening might look like a six foot opening, still gives you a couple feet for your jams each side. Um, 
we ended up having girders. We just ended up pocketing those girders right into the panel for economy. There's some different options. You can face mount, you can uh, use hangers. In, again, any of your typical wood connections work there. Um, as far as our panel to panel connections, we went with an exterior spline. These panels came pre-routed from the factory like this, and the factory also sends your wood splines, which you can nail and screw these things together. Um, exterior face plates, very similar to uh, like a tilt-up steel plate. You could have cast this into the foundation or bolted on. So there's obviously options there. Um, this slide I just kind of wanted to show you guys so you see what an what a opening cut with the CNC looks like. And note that what I was talking about between the, the gluing of the layers is these layers are all glued together, but each piece within the layer is not. That's why they don't work very good for your header orientation. Some of the things to think about is they're pretty rough when they come. Some of them look pretty good, but others are rough. They definitely need cleaned up and you can't leave them exposed. Um, you have some lower grade lumbers on the interior maybe, maybe a little bit of checking, cracking, some glue exposed here and there. So it's definitely not a finished look on your window openings. Um, last I want to shine, yeah? What do you do about insulation? Insulation, yeah, good question. We ended up putting rigid insulation on the exterior of the building, putting a metal panel over it. Um, some of the lessons learned we walked away with is, think about how, having some extra tolerance from panel to panel at your joints. Um, we had in our spec a, a, a typical panel joint and some tolerances work within, but at the end of the day, we ended up with one of the walls being a half inch too long, hanging over. Not a big deal, it's wood. They just cut it to trim it. Um, uh, one of the other things we, we, we learned was <coughs> we, you want, probably want to plan around a 12 week lead time for the panels to include um, those guys to do their shop drawings, build their model, RFIs, questions to build them and get them to the site. It worked well for us because we were able to do all of our foundation work within those 12 weeks and be ready for the panels when they showed up. Um, some things to think about if for certain type of jobs if you're doing smaller projects and you don't need great big panels you don't need all the CNC cutting is it is just wood one option is you could potentially cut it on site if you're dealing with thinner panels maybe a smaller th three layer panel or a thin five layer you know the three and a half five and a half if you can get a saw cut it on site is there opportunities to cut down that 12 week lead time get them out to site faster the other reason I say that is that those smaller panels are going to be way lighter and you can handle them easily with backhoe or small forklift, stuff like that, where your, where your lifts and heights aren't as high. So that's definitely an option to think about if, if you're concerned with the 12-week lead time. But what we learned is that's kind of the bottleneck right there, is really shop drawing and fabrication. Fabrication isn't so long, but the shop drawing process kind of is the bottleneck there. Um, and they, they require high level of detail. I mean, you can't send out a low level <laughs> detailed building. It, you need to have all your panel dimensions, openings, everything drawn exactly to scale, all that coordinated, because they're gonna hit you with an RFI on anything that's not perfect there. Because um, they want it to show up on site and have to do no, no cutting, no work, and it goes together well if you do. Um, like I mentioned before, also account for the weather and sun. If you have any exposed panels and you want them to look really top notch when you're done, Think about if they're going to be exposed to sun. Is it going to fade your panel anyway? Um, one thing we did see with ours is uh, the interior faces. Each piece of wood had a very small cup to it. Not when it showed up on site, but the finished product had a little bit of cupping in each piece. Again, is it exposure to the sun? Not a not a big deal, but something to, that we we didn't expect and we learned. Um, <coughs> the other thing, you know that you probably want to think about if you're detailing these and putting them together, it's just constructability. When you put two panels together, how do you make sure you plumb them and that they fit together? It, it's a connection that really serves no structural purpose, but it's just an erection tolerance. So think about a way to plumb your panels and get those to fit together nicely. Um, they also make these handy dandy little tools. Got a little hook each end, kind of a ratchet in the middle to pull your panels together when you're setting up. It's probably a must if you're going to be erecting these things. <coughs> uh, last thing I wanted to cover real quick is just help for everybody out there. When you're designing, how do you how do you get help on this when you have <coughs> questions? Who do you go to? And there's a couple options out there. Woodworks, of course. 
Ethan's going to be presenting later for us. Uh, the CLT handbooks out there, that's a free download on rethinkwood.com. And the other great option, have any of you guys been to the Mass Timber conferences before? Raise your hands. A few of you guys. So if you haven't and you're really interested in a CLT, these guys have really good seminar they put on every year. Next year is going to be in Portland, Oregon, March 2018. Um, I believe it's a three-day-ish event. And they're going to cover all these different topics in depth architectural, structural, erection, all of them. And they've got a lot of great material. I'd recommend you go to it. Um, they also have a lot of good manufacturers and suppliers there at the event you can talk to if you need help with connections, panels, anything like that. You want to see models and you want to put your hands on this stuff. They've got it all there. It's a great resource. Um, lastly is your CLT manufacturers. Those guys are a great resource for you for design-wise, construction, everything like I mentioned before. Talk to your manufacturer because the problem with it right now is it's not like dimensional lumber where it's all a certain size. Everybody can manufacture it for different sizes, thickness, and you need to design around that. So that's important to do. Um, lastly, thought it'd be kind of fun. I've got a little um, video our contractor put together, kind of short project, <coughs> get a little feel for what CLT might look like. Can you make it? Uh... That's all I got. If you guys have any questions, um, we can maybe answer a couple, but at the end we can do a Q&A for everybody. Yeah. It's kind of like a, like a log cabin um, in terms of having just a solid structure like that. How did you deal with a mechanical opening for running electrical stuff or any of that? Is that all done in a burn space? That yeah, that's a good question. Um, for us, it's a pretty simple solution. Um, we just had a big gym. We only had about three pieces of conduit that ran up in the ceiling, came straight down the wall. So we did surface mounted for any electrical. Um, it really wasn't a concern. But there's a couple options out there. You can do furring walls. You can do Z channels, whatever. Um, maybe if it's in an exterior wall, you run it on the exterior inside your rigid insulation. Um, but yeah, definitely things to think about. The other option might be some sacrificial layers of CLT where you route it in if you want to. Um, kind of costly, but I, you know, that seems like that's some of the options out there. And then if a big 18 inch duct shows up on site and you need to run it through the wall, can you just or drill a big old hole in the CLT anywhere you want it? Anywhere you want, no. But you know, but if your structural engineer is okay with you putting it there, can you, I think maybe your question might be, can you put it in, in the field? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's wood. You can cut it with a saw, with hole, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter just because it wasn't cut at the shop doesn't mean you can't cut it in the field. Like I said, you know, if let's say you're going to build residential housing, you want to use it for your exterior walls and lay it long direction. There's no reason you can't cut in your openings on site. You need to know that it's okay to cut them from your structural guy. 
but absolutely you can cut stuff in the field today. It looks, oh, it looks like your connection between the casting place concrete, could you use a neoprene brick gasket in there? Neoprene gasket? That was, looked like it was like a quarter inch thick. Oh, steel plate. Oh, that was a steel plate? Yeah. Did you compare the cost of tilt wall panels, concrete, versus the finished panel, the, the bridge insulation, insulation? Did you compare the two? I know what the cost of the CLT is, and I'm fairly familiar with the cost of like a tilt up panel. I think you're going to find your CLTs probably a little more. But there's some things to consider when you're talking cost. Don't just compare the material cost. Think of your labor and time as well. Are you able to get it up in a quicker time period? Or are you getting your turn on your money faster? And that's, uh, I think that's a big concern for everybody is cost. That's right. End of the day, does it make sense cost-wise? Is it cost competitive? And yeah, it's, it's a little more, I think, than some of those materials. If you're just talking the bare structure, but if you're thinking about how it all goes together, can you do it with less people for, you know, stick frame? Can you, you don't have to have a whole framing crew. Can you put it together with just a couple of guys? Yeah. So there's other costs to consider, but as far as your question of tilt up versus concrete, it, it's probably a little bit more expensive. And that's finished, that's insulated yeah. on the CLT is what I'm, yeah. Finished to finished. Yeah. yeah. So return on investment, what would be the payoff? On the dip, roughly. I'm not, you know. I'm probably not the best number okay. guy. I mean, you're going to want help from your contractor there. And, and again, every manufacturer is a little different with their numbers. And that's so where I think it, it, it's going to pay off if, you know, you can have a, any structural engineer help you with this stuff to figure out what size of panel. In fact, a lot of manufacturers can ballpark, you know, if you're going to, for example, a warehouse, they can tell you off the cuff, five layers probably the way to go. And they can tell you you want a V, uh, you know, V2M 1.1 series of panel, and they can help you with costs. And so it's a pretty easy cost comparison there. You don't have to do a ton of upfront work. You don't have to complete your design to do that cost comparison. I will add to that. There, there's a bunch of hidden benefits. I mean, that's, that's what Logan is kind of like touching on. There's like a hidden benefit here, a hidden benefit there. And you've got to find a contractor that wants to look at the entire project. Because we've actually costed a couple of warehouse projects and, and even just on crane time. You know, so these panels were 4,000, 4,500 pounds rubber tire crane versus a concrete tilt-up job, you know, they've got a, a track crane or something going on. And so on one of our jobs, I started showing pictures of Logan's like rubber tire crane, and the GC's like, whoa, well, we can switch our cranes, and that's 700 bucks an hour we're saving just on crane time. So there's, you know, material cost may be expensive, but there's a bunch of hidden, you know, holistic uh, costs associated with, with the CLT. Right. Who are the subs you're finding that are going to work? <coughs> No, uh, you know, for our project was a design build, and we got um, brought in on, and he's a newer guy, um, he's got experience commercially, but the thing I, I, I want you to understand, it's not that difficult, it, it's wood. I mean, it's not super specialized, but everybody is a little leery, like, who can do the work, but really, most of your wood guys could do the work, you could probably have any of your tilt-up guys do the work, if, if you're talking like a warehouse guy like we did, because it's very similar. Uh, we'll talk a little bit maybe into the weeds, but the sill plate, the pressure treated concrete, and you know, how that comes down. I didn't see straps, I, you know, big J bolts sticking through the PT, the pressure treated. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Or? Yeah, um, we, we actually do have J bolts for the pressure treated wood. And, uh, you know, we kind of went round and rounds on what might be the best way to, to handle this. And really, it's the interface of the concrete, which is not perfectly level, and the panels which are so how do we do those two and how do we make up for any gaps and gaps of tolerance there so what we kind of thought is if we can use J bolts not only use the J bolts for anchoring down your sill plate but more importantly kind of use those for leveling set your sill plate perfectly flat with your J bolts and any variance you have under your sill plate grout that in so you have nice solid bearing use your J bolts to snug that down so it's perfectly level use a level laser to get that thing nice and level prior to setting it. And then what we ended up doing is, when you have J-bolts sticking up, that would be just a giant pain to have to coordinate those in the field. So we ended up routing out a little notch out of the bottom of every panel 
So when you set the panel down, it's right over the J-bolt. So to be honest with you, the J-bolt isn't doing much structurally, other it's a leveling tool for your plate. Structurally, your connections, our connections came from our exterior steel plates. So how it fits in the building code, you briefly talked about it being a type three, five, or four. So obviously that's a type five building that you have built there. If it's type four, heavy timber, assuming it doesn't need to wrap the sheet rock, it itself qualifies as heavy timber, correct? I believe so. Yeah. And as long as that as long as you meet the dimensional standard for heavy timber, your post is fine. I mean that's a big deal because if it, if it doesn't, you got to wrap that whole thing with rock. It's it's going to kill its efficiency. Right. And then the the last one is uh, type three. If it's type three, that perimeter has to be non-combustible. So that entire those panels on the exterior all have to be fire retardant. Yeah, and I think the, the limitation, if you look at the code for type three, is your non-combustible exterior. So really, you're limited to interior combustible locations for it. So, or the perimeter could be fire retardant treated. Uh, sheet. So, so type four in the, in the IBC, type four CLT uses an exterior wall. Um, what happens is the hot gases can get in between the, the, the plies and start peeling them apart. And so what it says in the IBC is that in a type four exterior wall, you have your regular CLT panel, and then it has to be sheathed with either um, an FRT plywood or a gypsum you know, sheathing product. And that stops the hot gases from going in the panel joint. So that's where it's in type four construction. It actually doesn't say what to do in type three construction, but type four exterior wall and type three exterior wall have the same hourly requirement. And so we've gone to building officials and said, hey, this is what it requires for type four. Can we do this exact same exterior wall for type three, sheathe it you know, with FRT or gypsum? And then as Logan said, and then everything in the interior is just minimum section size. Um, type three, you got to run the chart calculations. Type four, you just meet the minimum section size. You're good to go. And that sheathing is on just the exterior. Just the exterior. Yeah, the exterior. exterior. Yep. All right. Well, oh, go ahead. So there's One a more. question earlier about insulating. Um, this may be coordinated too entirely different trades, but is it possible to create kind of a pseudo sit panel by having your insulation integrated into the wood panel itself, mm -hmm. or are you reducing the efficiency? It's like a sandwich panel to do it out of wood. Yeah. Interesting concept, but I, mean, I energy being a big concern here in Seattle. Sure, sure, sure. Tackling that. Uh, it's a great question, but I don't know of any manufacturers doing that. But hey, Logan, yeah. I have tried. Nobody will do it yet. <laughs> Mix in oil. Uh, I, I think basically, they've uh, they've tried but haven't done it yet. Smart land and structural land. Okay. They're looking at it. Nice All right. Um, yeah. If, if there's more questions, we can do we'll, a Q and A at the end. We'll have yeah. everybody up here in, in, in general questions. We can. We'll definitely make some time for that. All right. Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate your time, and um, hopefully you're a little more excited about CLT than you were before. <laughs> Thanks, Logan. All right. Our next presenter will be Ethan from Woodworks. My company, we designed the, the largest uh, wood or largest school uh, in the United States, a 470,000 square foot, $125 million school project. Um, we were a consultant for the world's largest uh, insurance company, so I get to fly around the country and, and see what not to do on projects, uh, which is a great, great learning experience. And so that's kind of my background. My background is like I've learned a lot, a lot what not to do, and I've learned like how to go prove my concept. And that's why we're going to talk about the tall wood buildings here because we're getting outside of that prescriptive, you know, height limit. You know, what we've got this prescriptive code. Uh, do you guys know what the Heights and Areas Act through Congress we're currently using to set our heights of buildings in the United States? 1930. The 1910. Heights and Areas Act is what sets our current day heights and areas of steel, concrete, and wood buildings. Um, anybody know in the Model T Ford one production? 1906. So here we have Tesla, you know, right here in town, driving these hybrid electric cars, and we're still using the Heights and Areas Act um, of the Model T Ford era. So that gives you a little bit how out of date we are. So we're going to look at uh, some of the tall buildings that are out there, um, some of the structural performance that we're doing testing on, obviously WSU, 
uh, is doing testing on that also to help you know move this forward. And we're going to talk about how we're getting through some of these tall wood buildings. So if you guys haven't um, seen it, our eight story is now dried in in Portland. So that's eight stories, uh, 96 feet, 98 feet tall. Um, so again, outside of that, that prescriptive limit, we're going to start construction in the 12 story uh, this summer in Portland. Um, and then right behind it, I've got, I've got another 12 story in Portland. I've got uh, a 12 story up here. I've got a thir two 13 stories up here. Uh, going on so I've got a lot of projects that are like really kind of trying to push that limits and I've got two other ones that are way beyond that uh, all the way and so I, I handle the Northwest but um, this is kind of my expertise so I'm working on a project in Florida working on another project in New York City um, you know trying to get outside of that prescriptive limit and so the momentum starts with a disruption and so when I started with Woodworks uh, we were a pilot program we're funded by the USDA the US Forest Service and we provide free technical assistance to architects and engineers. And outside of that, um, I decided, well, I, I'm kind of a unique person in that you give me a goal and I'll, I'll figure out how to get to it. And so Oregon, the state of Oregon came to me and said, hey, you know, how do we get more wood buildings in Oregon? I was like, we changed the building code. I was like, that's your hurdle right now. It's like, you've got architects and engineers who want to do this, your building code won't let you do it. And so what do we do? We changed the building code in the state of Oregon. Um, and that's what allowed these taller buildings. That's why in Portland we have the eight story, the 12 story. Um, we probably have the largest, no, we will. We will have the largest uh, CLT project in the entire United States. Um, it's a huge uh, multifamily project. That'll be, uh, it's gonna probably start construction probably later this summer also in Oregon. So it's one of those things like, how do we do that with, uh, outside of that in the state of Washington now, I'm working with Forterra. So I'm on uh, Forterra's executive committee uh, for advancing wood technology for the state of Washington. So, what works, we provide technical assistance. Outside of that, I'm trying to change a lot of stuff. Um, as Logan kind of attributed, we've, we've got different construction types out there. Um, mass timber CLT uh, in and of itself doesn't do well in the high seismic zone, so you're gonna hear that from um, you know WSU and from Logan. Um, it's a very stiff product. It doesn't have a ductility. It doesn't have a lot of flexibility. So when that seismic event ha happens and hits the building and it shakes back and forth, you want that building to slow down. You want it to absorb the energy and CLT doesn't. So a lot of the projects I'm working on are post and beam. Uh, so glue lamp post and beam system, CLT floor plates. Uh, we're doing a lot of panelized projects. So stick framed walls with CLT floor plates. Again, Logan mentioned these panels are typically about 15 minutes per panel. So we're doing about a story per week pretty easily on projects. And that's why we're stick frame panelizing the walls. If you're gonna sit there and you're blowing a floor three hours, and then you're gonna spend two weeks framing up a wall, it doesn't make sense. So we're offsite panelizing the you know, stick frame walls, bring those in, that speed of construction plays to CLT's speed of construction story. Uh, so we're kind of doing a hybrid of these three systems. Um, in a non-seismic th zone though, CLT makes sense. Non-seismic, a, a building just leans over by the wind and comes back. So no ductility, no real energy absorption. Uh, so non-seismic zone. So we've got a, a 14 story we're working on in Denver, full on CLT walls, floors, everything. Again, it's a wind governed zone. This is the first uh, hotel in Alabama, four story with Len Lease. Uh, one of the beauties is CLT is actually very robust and so we've done a bunch of blast testing and the blast tests have turned out really really good results and uh, any buildings on military bases nowadays have to be blast resistant uh, so my company we actually did some blast resistant structures uh, on military bases and the wood actually gets a higher rating through the federal document a governing blast design but it's really hard to stick frame uh, 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 you know wood a building on a base because what happens you also have projectile and so all of a sudden you, you got two by you know studs at you know four inches on center because you can't have the projectile coming through the structure itself so wood gets a better value in the federal document but up till now we haven't had a product that has a really robust face on it and the CLT works out really really well uh, there's YouTube videos on the blast test you can go check that out um, they're actually kind of dismal like usually in a normal blast test they set up a you know a canister of TNT they blow it up and you see the structure bend and you know buckle and pieces go flying everywhere uh, the CLT test CLT test they blew it up nothing happens 
You see that you can literally see they got high speed cameras. You can see the shock wave hit the building and just sits there. So really, really robust. The DOD is uh, looking forward uh, to do using CLT in a lot of projects now. Um, and then we've got nail laminate timber. This is Heinz T3. Michael Green and I actually both went to Cornell uh, at the same time. And um, you know, this is pretty basic. Seal, uh, NLT, nail laminate timber, been our building code forever. Um, this is just a very repetitive um, glue lamp post and beam system with NLT plates in it. And uh, Heinz is gonna do five more of these buildings. They found this to be a very cost effective construction type for them. And so a big part of it though, I will say is repetitiveness. And so high rise timber structures, I mean, we've got Michael Green looking at them. We've got Andrew Wall looking at them. We've got um, you know WSU looking at them. You know, so there's a bunch of people looking at how do we do a tall timber concept? How do we get outside of those prescriptive limits? Um, you know, one of the things everybody's been asking about cost, and nine times out of ten, I go into an architect's or engineer's office and I talk them out of CLT. It's a great product. It has its market, um, but it comes in cost comparison to reinforced concrete. That's where it competes against. I mean, that's where we're trying to get it into. The only projects where I'm looking at competing against the wood frame projects, the light frame projects, are the ones where we panelize the walls. That speed of construction, we can panelize the walls, and then instead of the eye joys, plywood, you know, slow construction of the floor system, we're slapping the floor plates really, really fast. So that's where it, the only place that it's starting to maybe cost compare out. But other than that, we're in that concrete market. That's where we're at. That's what we're competing against. Ethan, do you think that will change as it becomes more accepted as a product? That it'll compete more against other woods? No, I mean, I, I, th I think it has its place in that light frame market, but I think that light frame market, that eye joist, that plywood OSB is a super efficient system, super cost effective, and I don't think it'll ever just quash that market. That market, you know, you've got, you've got housing, you've got low, low end housing. As a developer, you're trying to be, you know, as inexpensive as possible on some projects. And so that, that eye joist just, it's so inexpensive, you know, comparison wise. Um, and how labor So I, I, yeah, I don't think it'll ever quash it. But I mean, we have projects again where people want to expose. They don't want the drop ceiling. And so that plays the role. It's like, okay, speed of construction and now kind of aesthetics. You know, you're never gonna want <coughs> the eye joist exposed. You're not gonna want to see that. You actually can't do that because of fire reasons, but the CLT, you could leave it exposed. So there's different reasons why you might use CLT, but it'll never squash that, that whole uh, low income uh, opportunity. So where this started, 2008, um, is kind of where it started all the way up till 2015, a 14 story, uh, six or eight story, I forget which one that is, then a bunch of nine stories, uh, eight stories in Germany. Uh, that was a seven story. And so people just kind of started popping up, these smaller buildings. These are people that had, um, the whole rest of the world is performance-based design. And with that, you basically go prove to the building official that your concept works. There's a lot of, like even Canada, Canada is more geared toward the prescriptive-based code, or uh, performance-based code. They have a prescriptive code, but their building officials are still more geared towards, you go and say, hey, here's my concept. I prove that I can go seven stories. I can get the occupants out safely. You know, that let us, you know, let us do this project. And they kind of go, oh, okay, you've done your homework. You know, and that's, that's how that performance-based design process works versus here in the U.S., the kind of norm with the building officials I work with is like, um, so it's seven stories. And table 503 says you can only do five. So how do I make this work? And that, and it literally is. They're like, they're looking at a table and 503 and the prescriptive code and they really struggle to just kind of prove a concept, prove like that's gonna work. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of these projects in Europe uh, that have kind of moved forward because they really are performance-based design countries. Um, uses, as, as Logan mentioned, there's a whole variety of uses. I've got, um, you know, I've got some of the projects I'm working on is lower level retail, several stories of office space, and then several stories of multifamily above that. So it doesn't have to be one occupancy, it can be mixed occupancies, um, but there's a whole bunch out there. Um, this is one of the first ones that started London going, is the Stad House with Andrew Wall. This is, again, non-seismic zone, so they use CLT for walls, floors, everything. Um, poor soil conditions. Um, this building was going to be a reinforced concrete job, really poor soils, couldn't get the numbers to work. Uh, so two of the projects I'm working on right now, that exact same thing. One's over in Aberdeen, um, the other one's down in Florida. 
really poor soil conditions, but these buildings are 50 to 75% lighter than the reinforced concrete counterpart, and so they can now make a cow-cow. Uh, affordable housing. Uh, the, the 12 story I'm working on in Portland right now, uh, the other 12 story that I'm working on in Portland right now is an affordable housing project. And again, speed of construction. We've, we, everybody's dying for, I mean, I've been meeting with LA, I've been meeting with Seattle, I've been meeting with Portland, and everybody's looking for affordable housing. How do we get something built quickly, fast, uh, inexpensively? So they actually have nine of these nine story buildings now in Italy. All CLT for walls, floors, everything. Again, non-seismic zone, they don't have to worry about the ductility, um, but very cost effective in the end. Uh, Forte, uh, this is one of the best stories out there. So David Cracknell with Len Lease, met with him. Uh, he was a superintendent on this job, had never done a wood job in his life, was a steel and concrete guy his whole life. Um, <clears throat> the, one of the, the things that happened, so this is a, a 10 story project. They poured the elevator shaft, reinforced concrete as a lateral system, um, only up to five stories because he had no idea how fast the CLT was going to go. And his biggest regret was not pouring that reinforced concrete shaft the entire 10 stories. Because basically he poured that, you know, it takes a lot of time, you got a crew of 12 people, and then three guys came in and blew out five stories in five weeks, and he was just like, oh crap. And had to pull everybody off the job site, finish pouring the reinforced concrete, you know, stair tower, elevator tower, and then bring the CLT guys back in. They broke ground uh, for foundations late January, early February, had tenants in in September of the same year on a 10-story building. And that's the story for the developers. That return on investment, that, you know, you've got tenants in the same same year, and your construction loan, boom, done, you got return on investment coming in. So that, that's kind of the story behind the CLT, the speed of construction. Uh, this is the treat building, 14 stories. Um, here's a funny thing in our building code that says we can't have wood braces. <laughs> and granted, this is a wood, uh, uh, sorry, wind design zone. So again, not needing a lot of ductility, but we've actually proven that we can do ductile connections here in our seismic zone with wood braces, uh, getting the ductility out of the connection itself. But this is a concrete slab there, concrete slab there, and concrete slab there. And then these are modular CLT units all stacking on top of that concrete slab. And then you can obviously can see where the brace picks up the load. And maybe that's a concrete slab there. Um, or maybe it's not, no, no, concrete slab, concrete slab. You can see where the brace is taking the load back to the concrete slabs, but these are just modular CLT units uh, stacked on top of that. The beauty of if you've ever done modular stick frame projects, they tend to flex a little bit, so you don't do a lot of hard finishes in them. Even windows become a problem because you don't want to crack the windows if there's any movement as you're erecting the modular units. The CLT, because that's so stiff, they're putting everything in it. Glass, tile, everything, because they don't move, they don't flex. Uh, so you can actually just literally on these units, they just had the plumbing dropouts, the electrical, they actually had a big connector for the electrical connection, drop the unit in, connect it, hook up the plumbing, done and gone. So everything was done, finished in those units. Uh, if you're familiar with London at all, it's kind of like New York City. It has the different boroughs like uh, Manhattan and the Bronx and things like that. Um, and Hackney is one of the boroughs in London. And they kind of stepped up to differentiate themselves they said, we're gonna do our entire borough out of mass timber. So all new projects can be mass timber. And they have, I mean, hundreds of projects going on over there right now, all just done out of mass timber. Uh, funny enough, still struggling with a six story in New York City uh, <laughs> when London has a whole borough out of mass timber. Um, one of the things that I will say, so here at the state of Washington, um, legislators and like that have been asking like, why we're struggling to get tall mass timber buildings here in Seattle. And one of the things that has happened is here in the United States, we went from the short buildings to like the five over two. So we can do five stories of stick frame over a two story concrete podium. And that's been allowed in Seattle way before the IBC. Now the rest of the country can do the five over two. Up to now the rest of the country has been five over one. Now the rest of the country can do five over two, but Seattle's had five over two for, oh, eight years now, something like that. And so to me, that's a seven story stick frame building but our prescriptive limit for heavy timber, mass timber, is five stories. If you do office space, it's six stories. So why, again, when the iJoyce plywood is so inexpensive, why would you do a mass timber building that can only get you at a maximum of six stories? One story shorter than a five over two stick frame building. 
And so that's why we've really struggled in Seattle to get a mass timber building going because the city's really struggled to you know, approve the design of a six-story mass timber building. Um, whereas in London, Europe, they, they never hit that light frame market. They never went there. They did steel, concrete, mass timber. They never hit that light frame market. So that's why you see all these buildings in Europe. You're not seeing them here in Seattle um, just yet. And I think, uh, and we'll talk about that. John Sue's great. He's on our tall wood ad hoc committee. Woodworks is on the tall wood ad hoc committee. And um, he's definitely interested in adopting that. And so if you've not seen it, um, the tall wood ad hoc committee is developing new construction types. And where that is and where that's going is still, I mean, there's a lot of hearings and stuff like that that have to happen. But right now you guys are used to, we have type one, type two, there are steel and concrete construction types and we got three, four and five, they're typically wood construction types. Now they wanna do a type 4A, a type 4B, a type 4C and a type 4D. So the type 4A would kind of mimic our typical type 4 that we've been doing, six stories. Uh, type 4B would take us up to eight stories. Type 4C would take us up to 12 stories, I think. And then type 4D was gonna be like a 20 story kind of project. And these were gonna become prescriptive building heights. And so that obviously has a lot of homework to be done with it. Um, primary concerns are fire and seismic. So that's what's gonna kind of govern and what we do with those projects. But this is a perfect example. Hybrid buildings, like, and, I, and I'm a fan of this. Um, I don't think all wood buildings are the answer, and I don't think all steel buildings and all concrete buildings are the answer. I mean, to me, it's just kind of the wrong concept. Why use a really energy intensive material when you can get by with a less energy intensive material and you know make these hybrid buildings work? And so this is one of the things, like why not use reinforced concrete as our lateral system? Proven concept, we've got lots of testing that proves that reinforced concrete does well in seismic events. And then have CLT, glue lamp post and beam as your, as your gravity system. There's nothing wrong with a hybrid building type. And so this is Brock Commons, um, reinforced concrete elevator towers done the entire 18 stories. And it's glue lamp post and beam, CLT floor plates as the gravity system tied back into the lateral system. So there you got your wood gravity system, really low inten energy intensive product, tied to a high energy intensive product, that's your lateral system, proven concept that it works. Um, do you guys know how long it took them to do 18 stories in the dorm project? Anybody follow that? So uh, this was kind of fun. I sat down with the GC and the, uh, the Seagate structures, the subcontractor on this job uh, about two and a half years ago. The GC was sitting there going like, this is the stupidest idea ever. We shouldn't be using wood and dorm projects. You can't make this you know, construction go fast. Uh, they do concrete jobs all day long. They're like, we've done dorms out of concrete. We know how to do them. We can do them better. We can do them faster. Uh, we don't want to do this. But the beauty is that British Columbia has a wood first initiative. And you actually have to go get bids and you have to prove that wood actually doesn't work before then you can go to concrete. And so they did this job, Seagate came in and said, well, you know, we can do this building. We can do it as your subcontractor. We can get your frame installed, your building envelope installed in 18 weeks. And the GC was just like, that's insane. That's just the stupidest thing ever. You can't do it. We do concrete jobs all the way, all day long. You can't do 18 stories in 18 weeks and be dried in. It just doesn't happen. Well, <laughs> the, the GC on this project started a concrete dorm on campus the exact same time as this one. Anybody got an idea how long it took them? That's a, that's a cladding system. CLT floor plates, glue limb posts at the corners of the, the CLT floor plates. Anybody have an idea? 68 days. Yep, exactly. Yep, 68 days, nine and a half weeks. Nine and a half weeks dried in. They were like the third or first story on their concrete job across campus. And that's when the GC went, oh, hey, this is the best thing ever. And they are out there now as the GC. They are out there giving presentations like, man, mass timber is the way to go. You should do your projects like this from now on. Uh, has a great story. So they finished in nine and a half weeks. Downside was they hadn't scheduled any subs to come in for sprinklers and MEP and things like that because they thought it was going to take them 18 weeks and they finished in nine and a half. So they finished way early and then it kind of sat there with nothing going on because they, you know, Obviously, you call up the guy doing the sprinkler system in the next building over, and you're like, can you get over? And he's like, oh, I'm still finishing up this building. I wasn't scheduled for another eight weeks. So it, it took a little bit of time and a little bit of delay. Um, every project I've done here in the US thus far has underestimated the speed of construction. 
I mean, the shoreline project we did, the roof on that job, they scheduled two weeks for the roof, they finished in two days. I mean, it, no one has estimated the speed of construction. I mean, the 15 minutes per panel is about right. When you talk to a general contractor that hasn't done it, there's like, ah, I'm not sure I want to believe that. Um, and it's hard. I mean, if you haven't done it, it's hard to like realize just how fast this is going to go. Uh, the project in Portland, I mean, we did the first floor in three hours, second floor in two and a half hours, third floor in three hours, and they were just floored. There was like, uh, I kept trying to get them to panelize the walls, and they were like, no, 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 because it, it won't go that fast. And they got to the second floor and were like, crap, we should have panelized the walls, <laughs> you know. So there's learning experiences out there, but as more and more of them are happening, we're seeing it. Um, so this is fun, again, uh, funded by the USDA, and um, when they kind of sent us out here, or sent me out here in the Northwest, um, they were like, oh, well, you know, go out there and change the face of wood construction. No metric, no nothing. And I was like, oh, all right. Um, and I just kind of started doing stuff on my own. Uh, started working with design teams on, on tall wood buildings that they wanted to do it. Um, the USDA, I think, had already picked a winner for this design competition. <coughs> and I get these call phone calls from the board every once in a while, and the board was like, hey, would you mind just sending us some middles of maybe some people that might just have like a rendering of a tall wood building? Because we got this design competition, we want kind of want to show that you know people are interested in tall wood. And uh, so I'm on the call with the board, and, and I'm like, well, I'm working on six right now. And there's dead silence at the other end of the phone line and they're like did you say you're working on six tall wood buildings right now and I was like yes they halted the design competition it was like it was literally like due like the end of next month um, and they had, I think they'd already picked who they wanted to do it uh, luckily that project funny enough fell apart on its own um, but uh, framework was one of the winners so they got a million and a half dollars again this is outside our prescriptive code so there's a lot of stuff to prove. There's seismic to prove, fire to prove, a lot of extra testing to be done. And so that's what that million and a half dollars comes in to do. And so with that uh, framework is gonna start construction this summer. Uh, right now it's actually up to 140, I think it's 144 feet now, uh, if I remember right. But basically we've had to go do some shear wall testing, uh, some diaphragm testing, some beam to column connection testing. Uh, we've done floor ceiling fire testing uh, at labs, proving you know that this concept works. Uh, if you guys are familiar with wood construction, it typically has a class B, class C flame spread rating. We actually did a floor ceiling assembly that has a class A flame spread rating. That's the exact same that's required of steel and concrete. So also now we've got a wood product that gets us a class A flame spread rating. And all of a sudden it's like, why aren't we doing more taller mass timber buildings with CLT as the floor ceiling assembly. How thick is it? It's a five ply. Yeah. So uh, you know what's what's the big push here? Uh, designers obviously improve performance, the the, the uh, precision of the CLT, uh, contractors construction efficiencies, trying to get your projects done faster, that return on investment faster. Um, architects definitely market leadership. I mean, I've got architects knocking on my door left and right, and like. I want to be the first one to do this. I want to be the first one to do this. And a lot of these projects, it's, uh, it's always been like, how do I differentiate myself? Because like, you know, the eight story is the tallest you know in the U.S. right now. Um, so I have another person that wants to do another eight story building. He's like, well, I, I want to be the first. And I'm like, well, you could be a first affordable housing project because he's the first you know tall eight story you know condo project. And so everybody's trying to figure out how to differentiate themselves. But everybody's kind of looking at that, you know. Uh, aesthetic, the, the, the wood aesthetic kind of thing. Carbon reduction, we got the AI getting to zero, 2030 challenge, getting to zero uh, carbon reduction policy. Obviously the federal government has their carbon reduction policy and half the weight of wood is carbon. So you take that out of the forest, you stick it in a building, you sequester that carbon, and it's the only building product out there that sequesters carbon to that volume. I mean, Bullet Center here in Seattle, I worked with Miller Hole on that project and that was gonna be a reinforced concrete job. Um, they couldn't get the carbon story to work out at all to meet that living building challenge until we started talking about wood. And that's where I came into them. I gave a bunch of data on that. And uh, we went so far negative on the carbon footprint of that building that we actually used less environmental friendly solar panels on the roof because um, they got us a higher wattage. But they were actually much more carbon you know, uh, exuding into the atmosphere to manufacture but because the wood took them so far negative on their carbon footprint story. So that's, that's huge. And you're seeing that on a lot of buildings uh, using mass timber. Energy performance, again, very uh, tight building envelopes. Structural performance, again, 
much lighter buildings and in, in a seismic zone, the lighter your building is, the less your foundations are, the less your lateral system has to account for. So that plays into the role. And then speed of construction is just off the charts. Um, and so carbon reduction, you're seeing this a lot and a lot uh, more on buildings. You know, again, that AA 2030 challenge, everybody's all jazzed about the hybrid cars. Everybody's seeing like Ford's got it and Nissan's got it and Tesla's got it. Uh, globally, if you look at transportation, that's planes, trains, automobiles, that's 16% um, of the carbon dioxide pollution in the atmosphere. Buildings are 44%. So buildings are three times more polluting to the atmosphere than all of transportation combined. And yet we're still spec and steel and concrete. And if you look at the chart from the AI 2030 challenge, operational energy is a big part of that. And you see people going to LED lighting, you see the more efficient mechanical systems, and in about 2020, when we get that, that operational energy down, the, uh, the material that you choose to put in that building actually has an equal value. So if you meet that 2030 challenge, at 2020, the material you're selecting to go in your building actually equals the operational energy of the building for your carbon pollution in the atmosphere. And that's why, as the wood industry, we're definitely trying to push that and show people that, that it, it plays a big role uh, when you look in the uh, environmental performance. So all materials, they do exude cat carbon to produce. Uh, concrete's definitely really, really big, but even to get wood products out of the forest, it does exude carbon. But then if you look at how much carbon is actually in the material and it can sequester, it always goes negative. So wood always goes negative in those calculations. Um, speed of construction, there's a bunch of YouTube videos. This is Andrew's building in London. Uh, we now have a YouTube video of the eight story in Portland. There's a YouTube video of the Rock Commons. And it's been hard because I'll meet with GCs all day long. Um, and I've met with Skanska Walsh, Howard S. Wright, Hoffman, um, uh, Lee Structure Lewis, all these guys. And I try and show them that speed of construction. And it's been really hard because the first video I had was this one. I would show it to them. They're like, oh, that's Europe. And they got different you know, skill sets in Europe. And we just can't do that that fast in the US. So then when Brock Commons went up, I showed them the YouTube video of the Brock Commons. They're like, yeah, but that's Canada. And they got different speed of construction up there and everything. I'm like, all right. And now we've got the eight story. And I can show that to people. And I can show that to contractors. And I'm like, well, here's one in the US. And they're just like, huh. Yeah, maybe I should start looking at that. <laughs> you know. So we've, we've actually had a good kind of you know transition. Uh, but there's a bunch of projects out there. And basically, these mid-rise projects are doing a story per week is what they're doing in a normal kind of pace schedule with a crew of two to three people. Concrete job, easily a dozen people. And this is done at a story per week with two to three people. So you start running those numbers, uh, and it makes a difference. We interviewed uh, all the people who have done these tall mass timber buildings. And again, these aren't people that are just doing wood buildings. These are people that have been doing steel and concrete jobs and have now switched to doing you know, wood frame jobs. And we asked them, like, how much faster is this in your typical steel concrete job? They came back and said 64% faster. Uh, just ran some quick numbers. What's an 8,000 square foot retail building cost with that with a 50% speed of construction? What does that do for you? Eh, saves you 60, $70,000. Okay, not a lot of money. Um, 40,000 square feet, you know, $7.6 million project. What is 50% faster do you for your for your frame and everything? And you're about half a million dollars. That's how Lend Lease on that Forte <coughs> building and a library building, they spent $3 million on R&D to see if CLT was a good fit for the company model. Between the 10 story building and a the library they did down in the harbor uh, in Melbourne, they made their $3 million back on speed of construction on those projects. So that's the story for the developer side of things. Aesthetics, um, this is one of the things I do butt heads with the wood industry on. Um, and so it's, it's I, I work for the wood industry, but I'm also, again, I'm a fan of make, use the materials where they make sense. Um, the wood industry came back and was like, oh, you, know, you should see all these fire tests we've got. And they look great and everything works really well. And so I went through all the fire tests, they're all encapsulated. And I was like, guys, how many projects do you think I'm working on that want to encapsulate the wood framing? And like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, zero. <laughs> So that's where DR Johnson and, and on the tall wood thing, we actually went and did a separate fire test uh, with it exposed, uh, which is typically what the designers want. And with that, we have to be careful. I mean, it, it does create smoke, and that's the biggest concern. When firefighters go into the building, is there too much smoke, and can they find their way through to get occupants out of the building? Uh, that's, that's the big concern. It's typically not you know, charring and structural failure. 
is how much smoke development. And there are finishes. So there are finishes we can put on the wood to reduce that flame spread, to reduce that smoke development, um, but something to be aware of. So government, uh, proving health of rural economies. So with the state of Oregon, um, I'm on the governor, outside of Woodworks, I'm on the governor's office for rural economic development, advancing wood technology for the state of Oregon. Uh, here with the state of uh, Washington, I'm on Fort Terrors Committee. Uh, state of Montana, I work with the, the Montana DNR. Um, now actually working with the Wisconsin DNR also uh, to do some of this. And if you look at our rural economies and what has happened uh, to them with the mill closures and things like that, it's pretty devastating. Um, so with GR Johnson up and running now, I help them get the loans and stuff to start CLT manufacturing in Oregon. Uh, they've added 15 jobs, and 15 jobs here in the city may not seem like much. Uh, 15 jobs in a rural town is a lot. And so it's been, a, it's been a great story to see that happen. And so that's obviously, I think, why Spokane and, and Russ will talk about this, um, you know, how that plans to help that uh, local rural economy. The industry, the wood industry, looking for market growth. Again, a lot of this stuff is steel and concrete. It's like, why aren't we doing this out of wood, mass timber? Again, not all wood is the answer. Um, you know, hybrid buildings, I think, are the answer. And why is the USDA, US Forest Service, interested in this? Um, so with the state of Oregon, I've written a paper, and that should get published uh, in June. And it talks about, you know, what's, what's happening with our forest lands here. I'm working with um, the Washington uh, Forest Protection Association, uh, looking at what's going to do to our forest lands here. And, um, you know, the big story is, is CLT, is it going to affect our forestry? Uh, and the downside, um, the Forest Service wants us to use more forests. Um, the downside is we're actually not going to see much of a change uh, for a while uh, in the state of Oregon or state of Washington because what we're going to find, what we found is that the wood that would go into CLT production will likely come from our um, export log supply. It actually won't start, you know, getting into our forest lands. So right now we're exporting a lot of logs. We're finding in the Oregon that it's going to come from our export log supply. We're going to have more value for the logs domestically than exporting. We're going to pull from that supply. So that's where that's coming from. But the big issue is, is that here's our forest land, our forest area in uh, millions of acres in the United States. And that stayed pretty steady from 1907 to 2007. And at the same time, our, our population has tripled. And what has happened on that land, though, is our volume of timber on that land is increasing. We've become much more efficient on the use of logs. So we, uh, you know, nowadays we use about 99% of the log, uh, whereas as early as in the 70s, we were probably using about 70% of the log. Um, the downside to that is you have the trees fighting for the same amount of nutrients in the soil, the same amount of sunlight, and so instead of healthy trees per acre, you got a bunch more weak trees per acre, and the mountain pine beetle will eat them alive. Mount pine beetle won't kill a healthy tree, but it'll easily kill a bunch of weak trees. And so again, this is one of the reasons why the Forest Service is in here saying get that wood out of the forest uh, because it's this fire hazard. And the downside is if you guys go camping, you guys go out in the, the forest recently, I mean, for me, it's been um, frustrating. You go out there and it's like, oh, this campground facility is now closed. This restroom facility is now closed. Uh, we were about, you know, about uh, 2007, we were spending like $100,000 an hour fighting forest fires. We're now hitting about a million dollars an hour fighting forest fires. And the Forest Service just doesn't have the money anymore to maintain the campgrounds and the facilities and things like that. And so again, another reason why the Forest Service is like, get that wood out of there, stop these great, you know, big out of control forest fires and, and find a use for that wood. As for pollution, uh, again, you can ignore global warming. Again, I'm not sure if it's a cyclical thing or whatnot, um, but uh, if you purely look at what we pollute in the atmosphere, um, you know, what we pump in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide pollution, uh, we're a pretty big emitter. So again, reducing our carbon footprint, using materials where they make sense uh, is a great way to do that. This is, um, I think, was the, the hidden winner of the um, design competition, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. They did this building in 1966, um, and they said, well, what if we did this modern day out of mass timber hybrid system? So this actually had reinforced concrete beams bonded to CLT floor panels, um, and what would that do to our environmental footprint? So this is the original reinforced concrete building. What if we just switched out some of that reinforced concrete floor plates and everything? What would that do to our environmental footprint? It's almost a 60% <coughs> drop. I mean, 
that's the scale you're looking at. I mean, it's huge how much wood can have uh, as your structural material have an impact on your environmental footprint. And rural economy, again, uh, trying to get those economies back going. I do take people on mill tours, and it's kind of, it's tough sometimes. You take them out there and like, oh, you just killed all those trees, da, 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 you know. I'm like, yes, but this is farmland. That will never see trees again. We here in the U.S., we go replant, and we grow more trees, and then we cut them down, and we grow more, and we replant. And so, you know, when you explain the whole kind of life cycle story to them, people realize it's a crop. You know, that story makes more sense. Um, and it's not a large volume of trees. So that's where everybody's going. Um, you know, Logan's touched on some of this stuff. Um, one of the big things we're running into right now is acoustic assemblies. So there are a bunch in the CLT handbook. We're actually working with Maxon uh, to develop some more. Um, again, one of the things that happens is that, you know, the one, a lot of the typical ones that the wood industry were promoting had the resilient channels and the bad insulation and the gypsum ceiling. And I don't have a single project that wants that. And so what I have to work with architects on is like, well, there was an acoustic, you know, assembly in the bottom of this panel. You want to see the panel now. Whatever is there has to go on top. So our eight-story one, again, that's high, a little bit higher end condos. So we're going for a higher, higher kind of R, or F, STC rating. Um, but we're basically got a seven-ply assembly on top of that thing to get the STC rating up there. If you're just trying to meet STC 50, that's pretty easy. Uh, you can do that with just a few layers, but to get the higher rating for these high-end condos we were doing, we actually had to go to a seven-ply built-up <coughs> acoustic assembly on top of that thing. So again, you want to leave that bottom exposed, it's got to go somewhere, and it's got to go back on top of the panel. So we're doing a bunch of testing. This is the normal thing, the normal resilient channels and then gypsum wallboard, but again, you want to take that out, it's got to somehow get built back up on top of the panel. That's one of the things that we're, we're struggling with right now is you know, start getting people to realize that effect. And so again, we're doing some testing uh, to prove how that works. Um, structural design, again, uh, Logan went into a bunch of this. Again, it's in the IBC now, it's called out as a, as a material. It's in the NDS for design values. Uh, again, we changed the state building code in Oregon and obviously the CLT handbook. Um, and so how are we getting to these projects? How are we getting to outside the prescriptive limits? And it's going through uh, performance-based design so that's where I changed the process in the state of Oregon. Um, I went down, met with the state building officials, and basically said, okay, what does, what does the code say? The code says you have to have a peer review. That's it. There is no requirement to develop a committee, send out RFQs, you know, things like that. And unfortunately, that's been the stance with the city of Seattle and the city of Portland, was that they were like, oh, we want to set up a committee. We want to get an RFQ. We want to develop an RFP or a, a peer review committee. And we're going to tack on 12 months to your development schedule. And the, the three meetings with the city of Seattle that I went into, the developers walked out the door, like literally walked out the door. Like, yeah, that's not going to work. We're, we don't have an extra 12 months to go build a building. We're going to do steel and concrete. Um, so city of Portland, same thing was happening. So that's where I went to the state, and again, with my work with the governor's office, uh, there's a process in the state of Oregon where you can actually permit the projects through the state, not the city. Uh, so those are the first projects in the history of Portland, uh, permitted in the city of Portland by the state, which upset some things, got a book thrown at me um, by one of the city officials. Um, <laughs> but you know that's why we have an eight-story and a 12-story, and now the city of Portland has done a 180. The city of Portland's like, how do we start doing these peer review performance-based design projects. Uh, City of Seattle, I'm still struggling a little bit um, to get that done. John's really trying to rely on the prescriptive uh, Tallwood Ad Hoc Committee recommendations that'll come out in April of 2018. But with that, we kind of know it's coming, so I've got several projects that are already moving forward with the City of Seattle, You know, realizing that in April of 2018, by the time we get far enough along with drawings and things like that, that some of that stuff will have already happened. Um, but basically, the basic thing came down to is like, can we go, so say here in town, can you know, GLR go into the city of Seattle, say, hey, I've got a 20-story project, and I want you know, KPFF to be my peer reviewer. If you work here in the city, you know KPFF has the qualifications. If you know, GLR brought in Joe Blow out of his garage, it'd be really quick and easy to realize like, that person doesn't have the qualifications to peer review a 20-story building. And so that's what we did with the state, the state of Oregon, was basically each person brought in their own peer reviewer and their qualifications, 
and just sat down with the building official and said, here's the qualifications, here's what they can do. And it was pretty easy. It's, it's not hard to see if they can meet that kind of <coughs> level of, of expertise to peer review it. And so that's what we did for the Oregon project. So we've got a fire peer reviewer, we've got structural peer reviewer, uh, we've got architectural peer reviewer, and the whole concept is, you know, how do we, how do we get there um, so typically we've seen the three, four, and five construction types. You know, what we started doing is like, well, let's look at the type 1B. Let's look at a concrete construction type and then prove equivalency. So this has, you know, two hour primary structural frame rating. Let's make sure the primary structural frame can last two hours in a fire. Uh, for, you know, assembly rating, two hours. Let's go do an independent fire test. Prove that that, you know, floor ceiling assembly can last for two hours. Um, you know, lateral system. That's where we, um, you know, through OSU and Portland State University, testing this rocking wall system. So again, CLT alone doesn't work very well because there's no ductility in the system. You start adding metal, metal fasteners, and are you gonna get into this? A little bit. Okay, I mean, basically this has post tension rods in the center to hold the panel in place, yield rods at the perimeter to provide that ductility, that energy dissipation, and so we'll go and test that, make sure it works. Um, make sure that when this thing rocks back and forth, it doesn't damage the adjacent structure around it. Uh, so we, we went to 6% lateral drift on our test to make sure it wasn't gonna you know, damage the structure. We're only required to do 3% lateral drift uh, by the building code, but we went to six to make sure it wasn't gonna create too much that more damage. That one went to 14. Say again? That one we took to 14%. Okay, so yeah, so this one, they ended up even go all the way to 14. I mean, it, it's, we're going the extra step. We're proving the concept works taking that research, taking it to the building official, saying here's the research, here's what we've tested, will you accept this? And that's the process you have to do. So, um, so they're popping up. Again, this table's even out of date. This is a 2013 and already Germany has a 10 story. Um, Canada has the 18 story. So we're starting to see them pop up. And right here in the US right now, we've got the eight story. We'll have the 12 story um, starting construction this summer. And so we're, we're popping up there. Um, and there's ways to go about it. Again, typically fire is one of the big questions and there's several processes. So I mean, we've got prescriptive fire tests in the International Building Code. We also have um, the building code tells us you can go to chapter 16 of the NDS. Uh, the wood industry has a bunch of technical documents on char rate calculations and things like that. The software that the fire engineers have now is, is great. Like back, you know, a lot of the fire engineers I struggle with right now in the US because they're typically used to doing fire analysis on an individual component. So they look at a column and say, oh, well, it'll char at this rate. But what happens when this entire compartment catches on fire? Is that gonna catch that next unit on fire? Is that gonna catch this unit right behind us on fire? The software that the fire engineers have now can do that. We can model a fire starting in this room and see how it rot rotates through the entire structure. And so they're able to model that and see how it affects the entire structure. Um, so instead of doing just individual component tests, which we do to prove that that floor ceiling assembly works, um, they can actually start a fire and see how it rolls through the entire building structure. And so again, that analysis software has come a long ways. I mean, again, now, like, I mean, the stuff I started programming on, our phones have more processing power than that. And now we've got these big computers that can run these programs all day long. So we're, we're proving that, again, um, one of the reasons why Seattle and, and Chicago had the great, you know, Seattle fire, the great Chicago fire, was we did a lot of, you know, back then, um, lath and plaster was an upgraded finish. And so a lot of your buildings just had one by interior finish. Well, how do you keep wood dry for kindling? You stick it inside, you put a cover on it. Well, we had one by material as the interior wall finishes, and that's why we had the great Seattle fire and the great Chicago fire. Now we put gypsum on everything. We've got sprinkler systems, we've got smoke detectors. And so again, going to fire marshals and showing them that like, we're not building like we did back in 1900. You know, we, we've upgraded our systems here. We have dual means of egress, we got exit signs, you know, there's ways that, you know, uh, to do this. So like on the eight story, it's a type three building. And so what we looked at is said, well, type three building, your regular interior structure can just be regular, you know, solids on lumber. We said, well, it's eight stories. Why don't we do the interior framing out of fire retardant tree lumber? Again, reduce the combustibility, uh, combustible material in that building envelope so to provide a safer place for the occupants. Uh, the egress path, so we're looking at the exit corridor. You know, sprinkler heads have to be eight, every, you know, eight foot on center, whatever it is. So to, why, why don't we, along the exit path, do them every four foot on center? It's a logical approach, it's getting the occupants out of the building, 
you know, providing a level of safety to them. You know, Brock Commons. Brock Commons said, you know, our, our lease on the building, by the time they did the fire test and they got the results from the fire test, their lease on the building was, you know, causing, costing them four and a half million dollars. Like, four and a half million dollars, we can buy a boatload of uh, gypsum. So they threw three plies of gypsum on everything. After the fact, they've seen some of these fire tests that we've done now, and they're like, well, crud. <laughs> we could have done one, one ply of, you know, five eighths inch type X on the floor ceilings, and probably just done two plies in the columns, primary structural frame, and been good. But at the time, it, it was what it was. So again, we're doing testing, we're showing the fire performance works, um, and it's really just a logical approach. It's like taking it's maybe a prescriptive heights in areas, but then providing a logical you know, approach showing how we get the occupants out of the building, how do we protect the structure. And so again, Bullet Center here in Seattle, we've got a bunch now in, in Portland going on. I don't need, so this is a seven story in Minneapolis. I don't even have the eight story uh, that's done now in Portland. And then we'll have the, the 12 story you know, popping up pretty soon. And that's that. So any questions? Trouble in the past with doing concrete masonry elements combined with wood in terms of shrinkage. Uh, I know you sort of said that CLT panels don't shrink. Does that apply for a 100 story building with CLT? You just never have any shrinkage? Uh, no, no, not, not there's no shrinkage. There's much less shrinkage. So, for example, they set a laser on um, Andrew's eight story uh, CLT building, and the entire eight stories did shrink up a little bit less than three quarters of an inch. So, about a tenth of an inch per floor. But that's pretty much, that's actually right around where concrete is. Concrete's probably 0 0.09 or 0 0.08 inches per floor. So it's compatible so, with concrete lateral system. Yeah, it's, okay. it's compatible, even steel, because steel, we have bolted connections and there's always a little bit of slop in the steel building, so even the steel buildings will shrink up on you a little once you get them loaded up and stuff. And so um, you have to account for it, but it's not as dramatic as like stick frame. The stick frame has a much more dramatic uh, shrinkage like to a half inch per floor. Does so the lever they, building have a concrete floor then? Say again? Is the lever building in Portland? No, we're actually trying to do the rocking wall system. Um, yeah. We're still, we actually had to get a little bit more funding for that to, to prove that it works. And We tested uh, that one's going on the third week of July on San Diego. Yeah, so third week of July in San Diego, they're going to do some more lateral testing on that. Still trying to prove that it works. Our fallback would be to do a reinforced concrete elevator tower, stair tower, and that thing. And again, you're correct in that the, the differential shrinkage in that is much more different than a stick framed building. And we don't, we have to account for it, but it's not, it's not dramatic at all. <coughs> What's the opportunity, kind of follow up on that, you, you touched on it, to put CLT and mass timber components in with traditional steel and, con steel and concrete and like high rise applications? What's the opportunity there and how far away are we from looking uh, I mean, the opportunity is already there. I mean, so the, the eight store, we did buckling steel, buckling restraining braces as a lateral system. And the beauty is, is that, I mean, so the rocking wall is a cool concept, it's a proof of concept, but, you know, we've got prescriptive steel and concrete lateral systems in our seismic area, in our high seismic area, that are already done up to, what's the height, 190? I think, our, I think reinforced concrete prescriptively is like 190, if I remember right, something like that. So you can already do that. I mean, so there's your lateral system. And then again, using a very fast, you know, less energy intensive, you know, element is your gravity system. So, and again, lighter weight. So now your lateral system has to take even less load to it. And so to me, it makes perfect sense. I mean, it's the perfect, you know, marriage of the two products. And, but then the concern always is, is, is you know, fire, you know, after that. But I mean, the affordable housing project I'm working on, they're like, we don't care. We just want that speed of construction. We're gonna encapsulate everything. So we're gonna probably use a reinforced concrete elevator tower in that one, encapsulated mass timber columns and CLT floor plates and, and call it good. So that's the, that's the opportunity, is that, that speed of construction. I mean, again, uh, if you guys have ever done post-tension jobs, I mean, those things can take two to three weeks per story. You know, and all of a sudden you're dropping a story per week with the wood, and you start cutting that off. I mean, the 12 story in Portland, Walsh has already cut off three months off their original construction schedule because they've started seeing the speed of construction of the, the mass timber CLT stuff. So, I mean, that's that's money. I mean, three months off your construction schedule, that's that's money. 
Why don't we uh, save the questions? For, I would like to give uh, time for the other speakers. Uh, maybe take a quick five minute break. We'll get cranking here at 11 uh, and have the other speakers. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, I'll give you a little background. I am started to get into, I'm about the only academic that plays in the game of building codes. Um, so, what we have, I'm an instructor, sure. I, I get a nine month salary a year. <laughs> um, I do research, I have made my reputation around timber. I also serve and do masonry research. But uh, it's around timber structure. I'm the first one to have tested light frame walls with an inertia load on an earthquake table. And I've been going since then. Um, I do a lot of full-scale testing components in full buildings and uh, anymore you don't really design buildings by only prescriptive if they're more than probably 10, 12 stories tall. You're going to be doing numerical work with it too. Um, and then outreach, uh, I probably, my uh, appointment says I have 10%, it's probably close to about 30% of my time that I do an outreach. So I'm, I was the one that mediated the warring parties for the IRC to get on the street. Uh, and then I've been on the structures uh, committee for IBC several times and the NDS. I'm on the committee that, that helps put that together. I've been involved in National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program since 1990 um, and MSJC and ACI for coal form steel. So you know what this is, it's just the definition of CLT, put it together like plywood essentially, only using lumber instead of veneers. Okay, and that's why APA is the one that wrote the standard for this. APA was the one that set up the standards for product manufacturing for plywood to begin with. It used to be the American Plywood Association, so the APA. And they've also, they, they came up with the iJoyce, the OSB, everything else. They wouldn't mind if we could do what they did with iJoyce, that TrustJoyce developed, Macmillan Bloedel actually, up in Canada, and turn it into a commodity. The problem is, is when you commoditize everything, everybody's driven to the bottom for pricing and innovation stops. That's why the truss industry is tried, the light frame truss industry has tried to not become a commodity. Uh, before Weyerhaeuser bought them out, uh, TJI fought it forever to be a commodity because they would stop their innovation and in moving things forward. So the manufacturers, the BJ and the rest of them at APA kind of took a different route this time. I hope they stay with it. Uh, PRG 320 is set up as a performance-based standard instead of simply a manufacturing standard. So any manufacturer can lay up their panels the way they think that their market niche that they want to play in, they can fit into. They can use any type of adhesive they want any type of species or grade of lumber that they want, with the exception of the outside plies that are high stress. And they restrict which grades go into that. But it allows each manufacturer to say, I want into this niche of the market, I can make these panels and make a profit with it and move forward, and they can innovate and move forward. So I hope that they stay that way. Um, does it mean that you're not ever going to see the design things in the NDS like you do for 2x4s and 2x6s? No, you won't. Because otherwise it's a commodity. That's all commoditized. These proprietary products will have their own, own ways. Um, so it's a panelized system. What's driving it? It's not going to be the feel good that, oh, it's saving the environment yet. The public and the isn't going to do that. It's going to be whether you make money on it. If the system's going to function long term, it has to make somebody some money. 
And though, so what is driving it? It's the construction rate and the savings of financing and the skill level that you have and the equipment that you have to use. That's what's driving this in Europe. That's what's driving it in Canada. That's what's driving it in Japan. It's everywhere. It comes down to money. And so the, the first time that Lynn Lease went and built that, that hotel down in Alabama, their crew were four Iraqi vets who had never done construction before and a crane operator. Taught them how to do it in four hours and put that building up in four weeks. Okay, that's really what's going on. It's the skill that you, if you get a crew that works well together, can work safely together, and a crane operator that wants to work with them, you can do things exceedingly fast and make things work and with lighter equipment and less skilled labor. You don't have overhead welding for special detailed moment frames or any of that kind of stuff going on. And are there braced frames going to be worked on? Yes, I'll, I'll go into that when I get into the research. It, it'll come down the line that we'll be able to do some of this stuff. So it was developed by a small company in Austria originally in the early 1990s and then in the mid 1990s the German and Austrian governments funneled a bunch of money in because they were looking at trying to deal with the Paris Accords and coming up that they were worried about and a lot of the environmental of Europe has been more uh, that way than we have for a long time. So the two governments put in a lot of money and they really brought it up to where now there are manufacturing plants in Sweden, Germany, Austria, France, a lot of different places, and brought it online. They've always competed more with current. When I lived in Stockholm uh, for a while working for Swedish Steel, the regular housing, single family housing, they don't, it wasn't built like we build it, and it competes against concrete directly all the time because of their insulation differences and all of that. And so their market for a commodity and making it a price mark is much different than ours. Initially we brought it into this continent through these two documents with FP Innovations up in Canada really pushing it. They made the decision back, Aero Caracabelli made the decision back in the, right at about 2000 they already controlled 99% of the housing market and light frame market. Where was the market growth for the forest industry? It was in commercial. And Arrow went down to the gas town in Vancouver and he looked up and there's a 1920s, 30s building, 11 stories tall, with dug fir columns and nail laminated floors. He said, why can't we do that now if we could do it back in the 20s? Right? And so that's where the Canadians really started pushing to try and push market share into the commercial market. And that's why they started looking at this stuff a lot faster than we did. And then when they helped us bring ours online, when AWC and the Canadian Wood Council was part of helping us write ours for the, the Americas too. 1915, it was into the IBC. Uh, as a uh, recognized material and in the NDS as well um, for everything except seismic. And the seismic has to do with about, well I fought for it through all the 90s and FEMA finally funded the project in uh, 2000 and we came up with a logical way to determine the seismic design parameters, a rational way. We had set, I, I got upset and it's the only meeting I finally yelled at the group and walked out and said, we were in Denver, 40 of us, and the 40 of us decided we were going to redo the R factor table. And so they said, well, when we went into that meeting, we were supposed to have some component tests or something to justify where our, our values were going to be. And so I pulled out timber frame because we had no test data. Heavy timber, we had no test data. We only had light frame. So that's all that the wood people put back in is light frame into that R-factor table for ASCE7. 
Well, SK Ocean, the, the concrete people said, well, here's normal reinforced concrete. We think the R is about where it was supposed to be. We're going to go call it that regular, re and then we're going to go to minimal frame plain reinforced concrete. We'll take a half hour cut on that. Oh, we're going to go to special detailed reinforced. We're putting a lot of extra steel in. We're going to take a whole R factor up, and that was their justification. And that went through, and I just, this is bullshit, and I walk, I walk, we couldn't deal with it anymore. And so I finally got FEMA to put a logical scientific method to try and quantify where these R factors come from so that everybody's on the same basis. And then they funded to go through and get a lot of the regular systems through that system to show that the R factor, right? We made some small adjustments, but now that's where we're at. And that's why bringing in new systems now for high seismic takes a long time. The R factor study for uh, CLT is about three quarters of the way through. I'm on the review committee for it. Um, there's three of us. Uh, it's got delayed by about a year because of funding the USDA and the Forest Products Lab who's really footing the bill on it. But it's cost a million dollars to get that study done to come up with the R factor. And so that it's not something any longer that's easy to come up with new systems and inexpensive. Um, but this is going to be, each manufacturer is going to come up with their own design for their panels for the market they think that they can push in. Whether the, the designers and the manufacturers get together like we did back in the 1960s and 70s for bridges and come up with a standard set of beams for bridges to cut costs and standard forms to cut costs for DOTs, I don't know, but that's market's going to drive that. That's not going to be dictated to people, I don't think. So currently, all buildings in high seismic, i.e., C, D, E, and F, have to be designed using alternative methods if you're going to do a building at the current time. Um, that doesn't mean the end of the world, and I'll go through that. If you really think about it, when you get to a building above 20 stories, you already are doing this. I don't think anybody can easily make a 20 story plus building conform directly to the prescriptive requirements of the code. And so there are parts of that building that are going to be under this anyway. So currently A and B. So how much territory in less than 65 feet or then allow some combustible construction essentially is kind of where I see it. Uh, unless the jurisdiction has implemented additional rules that will allow this through their own research, their own experience, all that kind of stuff, they can do that. A jurisdiction can make exceptions in how policy, how they want to deal. So where are things going to go? Well, all but one of the real tall buildings have all been built in low seismic. Um, because we don't have that information that we're comfortable with for the overall design of these buildings for the equivalent linear force method. And that's really the issue. Until we get an R factor study, and if you think that's going to solve your problem, it's not. Because the decision was made by the American Wood Council and the Forest Products Lab and those people to do platform construction. So you have one story walls with the floors on top and they're using only connections that are already connect allowed in the NDS and the tension or compression perpendicular to grain stresses on the floors are not going to allow you to go above four, five, possibly six stories. You don't have a stable enough structure after that. They don't have the collapse margin necessary. So if you're going to go higher, you're going to go to balloon construction. You're going to have the walls go through so you're on end grain bearing, not perpendicular to grain bearing. You're going to have to hang the floors off them. And there's no way around that. That's the material. Every material you design with, I don't care if it's concrete, steel, they all have an Achilles heel. They all have a weakness, and we design these materials for their strengths and to avoid their weaknesses. Concrete, it can't take tension. 
So we put rebar in there. Wood can't take tension perpendicular to the grain really bad. So we don't load it that way. Steel, coal form steel, you can't take compression very well either. Because it buckles too easily in local buckling. Every material has its weaknesses and strengths. We have to take the materials and design them for their strengths and avoid their weaknesses and combine them to make the buildings we want to see. So currently this study is going on. Um, we reviewed the um, at 60% and before they started their box uh, tests. And we had 70 comments that they needed to respond to from the review committee. But the Colorado School, uh, Colorado State, Colorado School of Mines are the two main universities that are doing it with the Forest Products Lab and American Wood Council people with uh, help from the FP Innovations people as well. They had developed the design methodology, made the proposal what testing they were going to do, we decided that they, what numerical modeling was it going to be the, an acceptable model and things like that. So it's going to it was supposed to take a little over one year originally. Um, it's been extended to two, probably two and a half by the time it's done. But we're hoping by the end of this year that we'll have a final report for us ourselves to review before we then send it on to the. Um, the Building Seismic Safety Council and, and ASCE 7 committees. So I come back to that <coughs> discussion. This is a map that I drew for when we developed the IRC and now uh, USGS puts them out this way. But we're essentially looking down here in all except for this yellow. So all of the white area and some of this, the green area, that's essentially where you can use um, CLT effectively and not have any complaints for any building official. Now you can do it in a lot of other places. You're going to design for an R factor of two, one, one and a half, equivalent to unreinforced masonry. You're going to take really high loads. But your weights are so low that it really isn't going to kill you that bad on low-rise buildings. And if you're putting up warehouses, uh, I'm sorry, you have so many walls there anyway that I don't care. You could design it with an R-factor 1 and you're still going to have lots of strength. So I don't see that that's necessarily the holdup. But if you want to go to slender, tall buildings, yeah, it's a holdup. So we're looking out about another year before it gets through start really being discussed in the committees that have to approve those numbers. The only, right now in the document, only standard steel and A307 bolts, wood screws, not those other screws, are approved to go into CLT. If you're going to use something other than angle irons, Standards, Simpson type hold downs, nails, wood screws, lag bolts, then you're into having to justify and prove that they are meeting the correct safeties in things. But the designs are going to have to be, if you're going to go tall, the high, going to have to be hybrid systems like Brock Commons. Balloon frame systems that are going through. This is also Brockham's. I didn't have a, a balloon frame system that I could show. And use columns uh, for gravity and walls for going through the, or braced frames for lateral. A um, lot of the buildings in Europe use concrete slip cores, slip form cores, and, and then hang the walls off, or the floors and walls off of, off of that, and count on that concrete. I'm talking about getting it to the lateral system. The, the lateral system will have to be balloon framed in order to to take the when it lateral the compression perp on a, a, a platform frame makes it too soft of a of a foundation on the upper stories and the drifts get too high. So only the perimeter wall would be taking that lateral. 
It doesn't have to be at the beginning. You can put that lateral anywhere you want in the building. How do you, the so framing allows the perimeter to hang off the walls of the outboard <coughs> floor structure. If your walls are on the outside, if you have a glass facade on the outside, it's not there. So I just peer reviewed the PV building for Oregon State University. And they're all, almost all of their walls are interior walls with glass facade. And all the, all the floors can lever off those rocking walls. So you're, I'm an architect, mm -hmm. but in, this, in Seattle, they'll only let you, uh, if you've got a glass facade, and you can take the structure only back to the residential 15 feet. So how far can you, if you have a glass facade, how far can you typically in, in uh, office building that's 35 feet? That's up to the designers. Um, I, from a structural standpoint, there's two things I worry about. The gravity, which I'm going to take with other columns, that's fine. And the lateral, which I'm going to, you can put in the center core or whatever you want. And then I have to deal with lateral torsion. So the building twisting, you, it's nice to have the walls out and so you have lever arm to make them work more effectively. But from fire standpoint, I'm not a fire expert. Ian knows more about that than I, or Ethan would have be a lot better at that than me. And you guys should know all the fire being the architects. You guys really set the firewalls up, don't you? <laughs> so it, it comes down to the fire. The structure, I can, as long as my diaphragms work, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about how far the things are. If, I, if my diaphragm's stiff enough, and I can get my lever arm, it should be okay. So a lot of the where you place things is more fire code than it is structure code. So this is the document that now covers. So there are six systems I know of that are currently trying to get new R factors defined for them. Two of them are coal form steel systems. Uh, each one of these are projects are to get through this are approaching million dollars each in order to develop the R-factors. Just for that one, three little numbers to line in the table. Okay. So where are things going? I think CLT, you're going, to, for the most part, you're going to count them as rigid blocks. And everything else from a structural standpoint comes from the connections for ductility. Now, you can take some toe crushing into rocking walls, which we do, but for the most part, the wood stays elastic and everything is in the connections. Um, this becomes an issue. You know, yes, I'm one of the investigators that's looking at these rocking walls, post-tension walls. That picture you saw was in my lab. Um, that system is the only system I've ever seen that's really elastic plastic for out to 14% drift. It had no decay in lateral strength. And I had, I had them redo the test after the first time, and said, there's no way a structure can ever do this. That's a coupon for finding out the modulus elasticity for steel. Um, but it was the structure that went that way. And I've tested moment frames, I've tested a lot of different structures. And it turns out when I think about the mechanics, that all it is is a long coupon, the PT rod being stretched over the height of 19 foot structure. And so it's a long coupon. So yes, it's elastic plastic. From a structural engineering, that's really nice. To be, it's easy to quantify, it's easy to make sure that your quality assurance is there. It's, it's a unique system when you do that. But we're also developing, we've just put a patent application in for a new inner panel connection. Essentially what you want from a, for damage control from a structure standpoint is you want a nice stiff structure when the loads are low. And then you want it to be a fuse and have really long displacement capacity with minimal decay and strength. That's the ideal. And so that's what we're trying to develop is connections that can do that. We also, I know that Jeff Berman put in an application from uh, UW here to look at the buckling restrained brace frame, but put it into wood. 
as the restraints on it for glue lamb. Um, but that's a, pat that's a patented system, so he has to get permission from the people who developed the BRBF to begin with. But this is the connection that's being put into the code for the new R factors. So you're going to have standard angle clips, bolts to the, the floor, nails going into the wall elements, and standard hold downs. Uh, and that's what they're looking at for the entire system. That's what the R factor is going to let you do. So that'll let you do five story buildings, not a problem. You can do that in life frame. So I, from my standpoint, I'm not sure that this is getting us a whole lot. Uh, I think that we really need to look at, open up the door and figure out a way that we can get these new design fact, a better way that we can quickly and expensively come up with these secure design values for new systems. <coughs> One thing I found out when I was doing that peer review is, gee, not one. Not one of the connectors coming out of Europe, which is where most of these connectors for mass timber have been developed, can qualify for seismic use in this country. They all use these self-tapping high carbon steel screws that are fractures when they hit res reverse cyclic loading on them. And so your connections come apart on you, and you don't have any connection, you don't have a building, right? So we're working, this is the, the uh, HBV, which is a glue-in steel, perforated steel, you glue it into the wood, cast it into your concrete. Works great from an elastic standpoint, but it can't take any deformation, it shears. And so for high seismic, the, the connections aren't there. And so, I've talked to the last Mass Timber Conference in, last year uh, in uh, Portland, uh, at the, this last spring. Um, I talked to every one of the Canadian manufacturers and our lab is setting up with most of them that they'll come into our lab and test to try and qualify for high seismic. Uh, right now, this fall, there's four of them that are coming into the lab to work this fall to try and get some connections out there for people to use in high seismic regions that are quickly assembled in the field. That's what keeps driving this. You have to have them pre-applied in the factory, come out on the truck, pick them up, fly them in, connect them together quickly and walk away from it. That's how we keep this system economical. The current research that's going on, we've had two NSF projects back to back. Originally it was five universities down through to here. And then with this new one that we're starting the, that I was talking about in San Diego, and I'll get into in a minute, we brought in Reno, Nevada to deal with the non-structural side of things. Uh, so you guys that are architects that deal in high seismic, you realize that all this non-structural stuff has to be braced and all that stuff has to deal with the seismic side of things. So we're bringing that into this project at this point. In addition, we have a lot of people in here and uh, since then that has grown for manufacturers. Um, Smart Lamb, Structure Lamb, J.R. Johnson, uh, Boise Cascade, and three other glue lamb manufacturers are all putting in there to help pay for materials. In uh, fall of 2020, we're going to test a 10-story full-scale building on the table in San Diego. Under, uh, up through collapse level earthquake. If I, have, if I can arrange for it, I'm looking to try and also have it tested with a facade on it and sprinkler system in half of it, have half of it encapsulated and half of it open, and then burn it. But I have to be able to also find a building mover that can move a 10-story building a quarter mile. So I don't know if we'll accomplish that. We're testing it for seismic. I would like to test it for fire. 
after it had been gone through the shake. And that would there's all four conditions, exposed, no sprinklers, exposed sprinkler, encapsulated, no sprinkler, encapsulated sprinkler. And see all well, those four conditions all in one specimen. I think that it would cost about a million to million and a half dollars extra to get that fire test done. So we started out with this. This is the one we've also done coupled walls with, you, with energy dissipation devices in between. <coughs> we can take that out. Um, we took it out to 14%. That was as far as my jacks could extend. But it had not dropped any in lateral resistance at that point. We had yielded the post tension uh, in it, but it didn't lose it completely. The systems have to be developed and tested over the next few years. Where that's the double coupled wall that we tested. So the problem is that these don't have a really high initial stiffness, reasonable, but not really high, but they have the real high displacement capacity. So we're looking at trying to figure a way to the new connection that we're going to test. There's four tests that are going to be run between July 4th and the end of July in San Diego. The public test for people is July 13th and 14th right now if people wanted to go down. It's two stories and I'll see if we can bring up the picture at the end of the, the, on the table. That's what I took off last night on the, the it's kind of dark. But we've cantilevered out the diaphragms out of the wall system to try and tax them as best we can. Oregon State has a project with the USGA, uh, USDA project to test and develop the design methodology for uh, CLT diaphragms and uh, Andres is working on that. Um, so we have four wall types going to be tested. Two of them, one is the Frameworks project that will be tested on this one to see how it works. One is the uh, post tension that our group developed uh, last year in my lab and along with uh, some people from Lehigh. One is a proprietary uh, connector that we developed along with Katira, uh, which is an up and coming uh, company now. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Hans Eric Blum uh, Blumgen. He's the other person working with me to on that connector. And then we're going to test out what uh, John Vandalit and company are actually doing the R factor study on and see if their numbers are even close to where they should be. And then the diaphragms are there. We're also testing at Lehigh a two floor full scale model in the Atlas uh, structural lab and they're hybrid. So we're taking floors five and six out of the 10 story. We're modeling the 10 story in the computer, imposing the loads on and displacements on the two story segment of the building, feeding it back to the computer for adjusting what the model is doing and running through the earthquakes on that specimen in Lehigh. And I have a student right now looking at trying to do a base isolation uh, for resiliency and rather than put the base isolation in the foundation, which then you have to have special first floor structural, um, we're going to put it in at the top of the first floor. And if you put it on top of the first floor, the floor doesn't have to have any extra span capability. You put two layers of the floor on. That's a whole lot cheaper than putting in special bearings and put a recentering spring so you don't slide off <laughs> and let friction deal with it. But how much difference does it take? So you tie the whole thing together and you're way out here as you come up through these stories. But if you cut it back, you're down to half the drift and you can get down to a third of the forces in the, build, in the floor below. And up above, you're dropping the forces in the building by about 70% with just one layer of base. If you go to three, 
above the, the fourth story and up, there's no load on it. So it's, we're trying to look at developing through that a little further. So we are also looking at composites. Somebody asked if we could do different combinations. And yesterday at Clean Tech Alliance meeting, I was asked on this too. We have a project with uh, Magnuson Kalemic right now that's looking at putting in um, both the composite floor with the wood concrete composite and what the structural side of that goes and how to, Europeans have been doing this a long time uh, and how to Im improve the span capabilities and the vibration response. So our code doesn't require you to do vibration. We're the only developed country in the world that doesn't require vibration criteria. Um, but that's what I've done a lot of for our light frame. And so we're, MKA is trying to do it f uh, and come up with a way they can look at increasing the stiffness and the tensile strength as well as improving the vibration response of those floors with concrete toppings, composite action to the, to the CLT. Or and theirs is nail laminated. We're reinforcing the compression strength by strategically putting screws perpendicular to grain so that you improve the compression similar to how you reinforce arches and glue lambs for tension perpendicular. We're doing it for the compression to try and improve the bearing for platform construction and maybe make it that function a little better. And then phase change materials in the walls and the floors uh, through a, a, an architect uh, faculty at Colorado School of Mines trying to deal for energy. So you have your cooling, you store your heat in the phase change material and you can pull it back out during the night for heating and things like that. So again, we need to overcome these two. This is what's holding us up. Is the seismic parameters, we're not going to get them for the ones that the way we're really going to build these buildings. We're going to have them, but it's not where most buildings are going to go with this material. <laughs> and fire spread. And we're really, I think we're close on the fire spread with what's went on with the frameworks. The testing went on with frameworks that made a lot of fire marshals a lot more comfortable with what we're doing than they have been in the past. So this is one of the framework burnout for one of the compartments um, and fire spread concerns that we went through. Um, but we need to overcome this one as well to make these resilient structures. We don't want to have the, the Nisqually earthquake have to rebuild the building. Okay, that wasn't that big of an earthquake. And so that's one of the things that we have to deal with. There's at least two uh, groups that I am aware of that's dealing with modular concepts for this country, especially for schools. The legislature, the state legislature of Washington put a big effort in to try and, and develop a uh, project where they want to keep the cost of schools below $250 a square foot. Um, and they were hoping that CLT and a modular system might do that instead of having mobile school units brought in. Uh, panelized concepts are also being developed. So people said, well, what about this panelizing light frame? Um, my understanding for uh, at least two of the manufacturers that are looking at this coming online, that they'll have a CLT manufacturing line, but they're going to have a light frame panelized system as well. If they want to go after the lower rise structure, they're going to have to do something like that just for cost effectiveness a lot of the time. And so that people are thinking down that, that path. This is my new office. We moved in last October. Uh, PACAR, uh, Sir PACAR funded the building for, to the tune of about $100 million. Um, it's, like, it's the clean tech building for campus. It has my labs in it. Uh, then we have our materials development group that works with our structures. The way we develop new products, we can bring everyone in from the chemists, material scientists, industrial engineering, through the structural, 
to make sure that the things develop. We've developed materials for the Navy wharfs, things like that. that through that process, it works very well through the iterative process. Then we have the environmental groups on the, and all of your regional air quality. You saw, see around when you look at what the regional air quality is, it comes out of our building when we, and they have a, the main sensors and stuff for our region over there on top of the roof. The new Floyd Cultural Center um, went up. Uh, that's the building there. Um, Exposed wood with a, a uh, nail laminated and some CLT on the top roof section and, and on it. Um, then we have the police station and we have the roof of the welcome center. Um, problem is, you know, we're one of the top timber engineering departments in the country. Uh, and we've had to go out every one of these dang buildings, every single one of them after they started construction to tell them they have to modify them. Because they're putting exposed wood out in the elements. They did this at Oregon State for the wood science department and they had mushrooms this size grown out of the side of the beams within five years. You know, wood has to be protected unless you're going to put poison in it called preservatives. It doesn't last out in the wood. The wood doesn't last in water very well. And so the detailing is what's really, you need to use wood correctly. We use more wood per capita for construction than any country in the world, other than Canada. We also misuse wood more than any other country in the world because we put it in the wrong places often or don't protect it properly. So our lab is an accredited lab. We're currently working to finish out to be able to be qualified for all of the tests for the PRG 320. If we don't have a client, we don't, we don't see a reason to pay a fee to be accredited if we're not having anything coming in the door to help pay for that fee. We do testing up to 200 kips. We, our new building has a, um, for a 60 by 120 outdoor strong floor and a 40 by 60 interior strong floor with a 20 foot strong wall in it. Up to a quarter million pounds uh, total loads in, in pointed. Uh, we're adding a 60 foot span, 20 foot max height with 10,000 pounds every two feet. And we have a full composite. We can take any material you want, put it into feedstock and make pr composites out of it in our lab. With that, any questions? We have a little we'll bit of time. Some questions and then we'll let Russ one. come up. So you're saying that you're doing all this lateral analysis because the Europeans really haven't had to do that? No, they haven't because there's only um, southern uh, Spain, southern up through the middle of Italy and Greece are the only ones that deal with seismic. And so they haven't ever even thought. Now, Ario Sakati tested a seven, a five-story CLT building on the E-Defense earthquake table and managed to make it come out elastically. He had Simpson strong time. They had six hold downs at the end of each wall panel. <laughs> All right. Um, they had a 0.8 G maximum acceleration at the base top of the building over 5G. So do you think that you can survive hitting that wall five times the, uh, your weight? <laughs> the building survives, but the occupants are dead. It just, it can't, that doesn't work. That's not a functional building, in my opinion. And so we have to develop some that can have some ductility, energy dissipation, and cut those down. That's why you want a building that's stiff for low loads, flexible for high loads in an earthquake. Uh, so you don't have all the damage for a, a typical frequent earthquake, but you don't collapse it or kill the people in the high earthquake, right? That's your opposite ends of this balance and how to make it work. So have you been talking about this tall rocking wall design? Mm -hmm. that right? That's the one that our project is dealing with, yeah. Okay, so you're trying to get connections that will work for a rocking wall. 
I'm trying to also, so yeah, the rocking wall uh, that they put in for the, the um, PV building uh, in Oregon State, they put a four inch concrete topping on top of a CLT floor. And they designed it for the concrete to be the diaphragm for the laterals. But when they took the walls out to the drift, you had a plus or minus total out to out, six inches deformation up and down out of that floor over a 12 foot span. I'm sorry, four inches of concrete can't do that. <laughs> so they were tearing up their connections and they would, they would lose everything. So I had to make them design a special hinge connection and, and, and have, be able to tolerate those kind of drifts in order to make that work. And that's an expensive connection, really expensive connection. If you're gonna take it through one single pin, the entire floor. It's always steel then, right? Steel is the only material that you consider for that? Well, it's, it's the only material that's affordable. Some of the other materials are pretty expensive. And the plastics, people haven't been willing to trust for fire reasons. So, but I'll stop there and we'll, because yeah, well, otherwise Russ's not going to be able to talk. <laughs> Timbers. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So this is my focus. It's the forest. I grew up in eastern Washington, northeast Washington to be precise, in Colville. Went to Washington State University. Uh, I spent a lot of time here. And this is what it looks like in northeast Washington. A lot of people in the Seattle area, they maybe travel to Spokane or they drive to the east side of the state and they don't think there's any trees, but the north half of the state is almost all forested. And this is a little blown out, but I took this with my drone. This is post-harvest is what it looks like when we're out there. So Ethan talked about the west side of Oregon and Washington being a crop. In many parts of northeast Washington, north Idaho, western Montana, and then south along the Intermountain West, the fire-prone stands, we're doing uneven age stand management. So we're thinning the forest constantly. And that again is that same site. You can see they've still got a lot to go there, but that's thinned on the right. Um, and this is how thick it is. So you can imagine when we have 100 degree days and 30, 40 mile an hour winds and we get dry lightning, this side's gonna burn really quickly because of the fuel loads. This side is probably not thinned enough, but it's for habitat and some other reasons. So that's the material that we're going to be taking out of the forest. And I spend a great deal of my time collaborating with conservation groups, other members of the public, and I also sit on the board of the Sustainable Northwest, which is a group based in Portland that also works in Washington, to help facilitate collaborative groups to help solve some of these issues out on the forest. These forests that we're talking about are federal forests. So this is the Forest Service and the Department of uh, Bureau of Land Management. And what we've done over the last 30 years is we've basically gone away from management. The whole spotted owl thing that happened in the, in the late 80s and then the shifting away from, from management, we started at the same time we were suppressing fire. So we were putting out every fire we could. Well, what happened to the fuel? It just grew up and got thicker. So this is a, a shot of our log yard. So those small logs that are out in the landscape, we bring them into the mill and we turn them into lumber. We use a 128-foot uh, portal crane to handle the material because in one big uh, grapple load of a truckload, we can actually keep from breaking those small pieces because those trees are pretty s small. If you take with a machine and pull that load apart, you're going to break some of those smaller pieces. So we use a bigger, bigger crane to handle that. And there's another shot of it there. So when I say small logs, what I'm talking about, we start at four and a half inches. We make two two by fours out of that. And then we go all the way up to about the size of the steering wheel of a car is the largest log that we utilize. So when we're talking about small logs, we're really talking about small logs. So when you hear about 
the old growth issues and that kind of thing, we're not even close. We actually have to sell about 15% of the logs on our jobs, both our, uh, the land that we operate and other jobs that we control to other mills with larger um, breakdowns in their sawmill. Again, small logs here, we use a very efficient process. So as we move into mass timber manufacturing, we're going to utilize a lot of the things we've learned in surviving through the, uh, through the timber wars by maximizing efficiency. And when I talk about the timber wars, I'm talking about the environmental movement against the sawmill infrastructure. There were 700 sawmills in the West. Now there's like 90. So they were all really consolidated and compressed. And we went through that process as well. So that's the entirety of our sawmill. It's about the size of a small RV. And everything at our facility is built around getting material either to it effectively or away from it effectively. And then we, we pile up mass quantities of lumber and then we go through the process of breaking those down and getting those into appropriate areas. We also utilize all the product. Um, I think, Ethan, you said something about 99% utilization. Really the only thing that we don't utilize is something that gets contaminated with mud or dirt or something like that. But even that, we put into the bark to go into the biomass, either biomass power or in the case of our facility, we use that in a boiler system and then we use that steam to not only heat the buildings but also dry the lumber, which is here. And then the lumber goes in for final processing. We have a MetroGuard machine, which MetroGuard actually started in Pullman. It was, it's a non-destructible bending test that gives you the E value every inch of the piece. So we know structurally how strong each piece of lumber is for every inch. Then it goes out on the line to be uh, to graded and sorted. We actually, this is all automated grading. So those lights right there are actually illuminating the piece. We've got cameras up above at angles and at the ends so we can see each piece and then that gets handed off to a software program to look at all the grain, all the knots, every piece of biometric problem or uh, quality that's in that piece and then it goes out and gets uh, trimmed and sorted accordingly. And then we have a testing room for that as well. So we, we uh, pull apart boards to make sure that the actual MetroGuard reading is accurate. There's some of the machine stress rated material. How many species are you working with? Is that all the same species? No, it's like, it's like seven. So the question was how many species are we working with? In eastern Washington, we have a, a wide diversity of forests. So each forest changes as you move to a different drainage and elevation. So lodgepole pine, Engelmann spruce, that would be ESLP <coughs> grade. When you hear SPF, or spruce pine fir in Canada, it's really the same thing. It's just different, uh, different grades across the border. Fir larch or Douglas fir. So fir larch is an inland uh, variety that grows a lot slower and is a lot stronger. Larch actually is tremendously strong, slow growing. And it's very fire resistant um, as a tree. And it makes for very strong lumber. So if we were to take our highest grade, like 2850 MSR that goes into open web trusses, it's almost all larch. And then true firs, and there's a whole host of others. Um, this is uh, a shot of some MSR here, 2100F. But you see the slogan there, small logs, better lumber. That was developed to try to tell the story, because a lot of people thought, if we're utilizing small logs, we must just be utilizing the tops. There's lots of knots up there, and it's not really good material. We're actually utilizing dense, small trees that haven't been growing effectively. So that leads me to my latest project, which is Vaughan Timbers. We're going to take the lessons learned and the product that we produced in the mill and put it vertically integrated into mass timber products. The reason behind that, and my why, is getting back to the forest and telling that story. You know, we talk about the carbon footprint and all of that. One story we haven't told is what if we were restoring our forests in eastern Washington that would otherwise burn up in a fire? We just saw a report come out that said that uh, forest wildfires are three times more polluting than we initially thought, and possibly even more. It's, in 2015, was the number one pollution source in the state of Washington. Um, what if we were able to go out to that forest 
thin those trees, restore that landscape, and the byproduct of getting that healthy forest were products like this. I think that's a pretty powerful story, and we intend to tell that story. And I believe that we can actually, uh, my vision is to create the Austria of North America in our Intermountain West corridor. And, it, and I can talk a little bit more about that. But this is a, a diagram of, it's actually Andrew Waugh's house. He's an architect in London with Waugh Thistleton. Went and visited their, uh, their office uh, about a month ago. And it's pretty impressive the stuff they've been doing with wood there. Interestingly enough, they're not producing it in Great Britain, but they're bringing it in from Austria, Germany, France, Switzerland, and the Scandinavian countries. Here's the CrossFit gym that Logan talked about earlier. It's just simple, awesome structure that went together very quickly. And to the point that was made multiple times, I haven't seen a project yet where they haven't been ahead of schedule on the construction. Which, and most of the times they weren't trained in it. So this is very interesting. These are the four manufacturers in North America now, two in Canada, two in the US. There are more coming online, but these are who make CLT to date. And there's about somewhere between 40 and 50 producers in Europe. None of these would be outside the bottom quartile. These would all be antiquated facilities in Europe today. So much further ahead in terms of technology and production capability. So this is a, a diagram, I believe Minda put this together. And this just shows, you take lumber, you finger join it together, you make it long, then you lay it up, you glue it, you press it as it comes through, then you cut out the doors and window frames. Um, we're gonna use a different technology to where we do this part ahead of that. So we're gonna press it with the doors and windows already roughed out. The reason is the value of the raw material is about 50% of the cost. So why would we be cutting the blocks out and then have a non-usable block? So we've discovered that there's a company in Europe producing a press line that will allow us to do glue lamb beams and CLT in the same press line using radio frequency technology to cure the adhesive at a high rate of speed. What does that mean? This shows you right here. <coughs> It's what they call the combi press. So you can see the layers. They've already been finger jointed. They're going on here. Now you have to envision in this space here, there's going to be a layup line that's going to put the cross lamellas in, the shorter pieces that are going to go in there. That will have a layer of adhesive. It'll automatically place the short lamellas on there. And then it will put the other layer on top. And you could do three, five, seven plies. Goes through that system. Every, so there's the press there. So it's about every 12 feet, and it goes in there and sits in there anywhere from a minute to three minutes. It's essentially extruded, so it's a very linear process. But the company that's developed it has figured out how to identify where the voids are to keep from pushing the platens against one another and then bending the plates. And this is, uh, this is the vision I have for what we're going to do in North America. This is Hosslehurst site in Sachsenburg, Austria. And they're a 115-year-old sawmill company, very similar to a, a sawmill uh, company that my family has owned and operated here. And they are on the cutting edge of the worldwide production in terms of mass timber. But if you notice all the solar panels on there, they're making pellets, they're using wood energy, they're doing all kinds of amazing things that we don't think of when we think of wood products here. And in 2015, they were awarded Austria's Green Company of the Year. So I think we need to bring that vision together in order to produce product, products that are really green, not just kind of green. And when you talk to Andrew Waugh in London about his projects, the reason that he started moving that way is because he wanted to do something that was transformative in terms of the environment. And he in the way he says it, he says, I just thought it was bullshit that you put a windmill or a solar panel on top of a building constructed the same way and we called it green. And so he went out and looked for a material and it just happened to line up. He actually said that the first few years, he, it was really tough. He's trying to convince everybody to use timber and now he's completely booked out. So I think that's a pretty amazing story. 
and then there's my closing slide. And, and that's the other reason why that's my seven-year-old daughter. Getting to go out in the woods and take video and talk about this kind of thing is, is pretty awesome. So thank you. Well, thank you. Is there any questions for, uh, for Russ? Just uh, so your system is all online now? You're no, no, we're just ordering equipment. So we're going to be online in 2018. 19. 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're working with Structure Lamb right now because we already okay. supply them with material. Okay, so that's who we're Yeah, doing. and uh, interesting, um, I heard something earlier that was, uh, I can't remember if Ethan said it, but uh, DR Johnson, if you go to their facility in, in Western Oregon, um, they're typically using intermountain species to press their panels. So every shot that I've seen had Bennett Forest products in it. That's in North Idaho, or our product, or others in it. Um, there's a few reasons for that, but we produce a really good quality material because it, it just it's so uniform in the way that it grows. So can I ask the point of question? Are you going to partner with Katera, or are you? Absolutely not. <laughs> Now let me let me let me and stop so there. What foot panel are you looking at then? Are you doing the four foot? Yeah. So so yeah, we're doing four feet by sixty is going to be our our phase one. That's going to allow us to do glue lamp beams, which we think is a very complementary product to this. Um, but we're going to do longer. So we're going to do four foot by sixty feet, and that will allow us to do floor systems and other things. But it'll also allow us to handle the wood all the way through the logistical chains that lumber already goes in. So a lumber unit is 50 inches wide, our panels are 50 inches wide. If you go 8 or 9, you have to have a different logistical chain to move that around to deliver it into to the, the build site. So you can use the same forklift, you can use all the same kinds of things that you would for lumber. So we believe that's a good starting point for contractors and builders to start using this product, probably in floor systems, get more used to it, and then go, okay, let's start using it for wall panels and different places like that. How are you going to ship a 60-foot panel down the road? Well, you can ship a 60-foot panel, but I, I, I think you just... 20, like the container is 22 feet, something like that. Yeah, well, you can ship it, uh, right now I think it's... I think it's like 56 feet or 53 feet you could ship right now without any issue. I think you'd need... 60 foot pieces of rebar all the time. Yeah, I think you just have to have the over length load on there. Depends on the state. <coughs> yeah, of course. Logan. Any thoughts on availability? Is there ever the thought that this could be more of a common stock item that you can go and... So the four foot, the, well it's 1.25 meter panel is a stock item in Europe. So, okay. and, and I didn't realize that when I first started down this path and I started looking at it, and it just starts to make sense, right? It's easier to handle. It, you're not putting the custom elements of doors and window cuttings in there. You're actually doing that after because it's a smaller piece. Um, so the, it starts to get more custom when you get the wider pieces. This is a, I worked with this old Austrian architect. Mm -hmm. And he said, how many ways can you divide 10, and how many ways can you divide 12? And yep. so, I mean, there's only two ways to divide 10. There's an infinite ways to divide 12. Right. And so if you want to make cabinets, anything, you can just, this is just yep. more modular than 10. And I do believe, I saw modular up there. I'm part of a project in Spokane where we're going down the CLT modular track, and mm -hmm. we see a tremendous amount of opportunity there. One thing that coming up is the, in the seismic, if you go to really long, stout panels, you're going to have a really difficult time getting anything that will function in the seismic if it won't perform. So and the R factor is going to have restricted one to one aspect ratios in your walls. The floors can be anything you want. Yeah. To touch on Logan's point a little bit more on the availability. So when I said that the current manufacturers, they're, they're doing a fine job, but they're using technology that's about 10 to 15 years behind what they're using in Europe. So their throughput costs are limited, so they can't really force the cost much lower. Um, we intend to put together a system right out of the gate that will be at world class competing with the top companies in, in Europe, and we're actually partnering with the company that I showed you uh, the, the shot of there. 
So we're not reinventing the wheel and not learning from what they're doing. And I think by doing that, as the market grows and we can start to see more production come online, we can start to see the price come down of the material. So related to cost, D.R. Johnson is taking the product and transporting <coughs> it to their plant down in western Washington, so going kind of east and west with the raw material. What you guys are proposing is more short travel distance for the raw material, potentially a larger travel distance for the finished product. Is, there, is that a more effective transportation cost? It's really simple. So the more value you can put on a product at the source, the further you can ship it. Because the way we see it is we're going to vertically integrate that process. So we're going to try to go from forest to structure. We think there's a lot of value in that so people can really be connected to the build element that they have. Right now, we take two by fours and it just gets washed out into the commodity world, right? So we really aren't able to tell that story. So I think the CLT glue lamb elements being vertically integrated and tying to it will allow us to tell that story. And I mentioned I'm on the board of Sustainable Northwest and we're coming up with a, um, a restoration wood concept that's actually further than like FSC certification. And I've been working with the Living Building Challenge folks on creating a living building product line that would allow us to really go beyond just, hey, there's a stamp on it that says you did the right thing. We're going to be able to tell that story even further. Yeah. Well, I'd uh, open it up to the uh, rest of the presenters here uh, if there's some questions that weren't answered. Um, Logan or Ethan or Dr. Dolan here. Uh, any trouble with banks financing these projects? <coughs> Are you talking about the construction of the facility or the actual oh, no, projects? Uh, uh, the building that's constructed with CLT. Do uh, banks have any issue with it? I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, we've not, we've not seen that be an issue. The only, the only issue that's ever popped up thus far is we've had a couple of questions from the insurance, <coughs> um, you know, insuring the project under construction, and then insuring the, uh, the project of the longevity of the structure, but um, it's kind of funny, the, the one big hurdle one we had was the carbon 12 in Portland, and more of that actually came from because it was a condo project versus what the actual structural material was. But other than that, like, especially in Europe, I mean, they, they don't see it at all. They don't, they're just like, oh, whatever, it's a, it's a building, it's got to meet the same fire rating, the same, you know, everything, so they, and structural capacities and everything, so they don't, they don't even blink an eye over there and over here it's more been like okay what's the fire what's you know that but we've sat down with quite a few of them and like well we're still meeting the two hour fire test here's the fire test we've done and there's like oh okay so that's it all right question for dr dolan for the um for the lateral question is anybody looking into the ductility in the manufacturing process of the clt panel or is it kind of it is what it is, and what it's always going to be. Is, uh, yeah. I'll just soften it up. Don't make it so rigid. Yeah. Um, is there opportunity in the process to, to make it less rigid? It's <laughs> it, it would be, short of changing the actual material, it would be very difficult. Uh, short of not, so I don't know if you plan on edge gluing. No. Um, in Europe, a lot of them edge glue to a panel and then they lay up the panels at like plywood. So then it's glued on all four sides. It's really hard to get any ductility out of that. Um, but you would have to change the orientation of a lot of the, and so you, it, by making it softer to where it could deform, you would lose your compression parallel to grain of the faces and stuff like that. So you'd give up some of the other properties at the same time. So where our our adhesive uh, research has determined that there's two types of um, adhesives that work in this process. And one of them actually has more ductility built into it. It stays, it doesn't harden like a rock. It actually has some shifting. I don't know how that translates into the actual structure because <coughs> it's almost like you're webbing right. the material together because the glue is stronger than the wood. So it becomes very rigid. But the there's a lot of there's a lot of research in the connection side of it yeah. to say put friction pull downs to where it can rock a little easier those kind of things or 
stiffen up or soften the foundation part of it. That, there's a lot of looking at that part of things. I think one of the good news parts to this is that right now the market is supply constrained. So there are more projects that want to go forward with CLT than there is CLT available on the time. So as this market develops, we'll be able to learn over time to do things like that and the connections and maybe you know, hybrid stuff so we you know, can handle things a little bit more. Uh, a lot of people talk about the codes and the restrictive part about it, but within the code now, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to use this product. And the other thing, they've always had alternative means and methods. But also ICC just has their first draft out this cycle of performance-based code. And so when people start moving over and adopting the performance-based code, we'll be acting more like they do in Europe at that point. I also have a project that starts up in uh, probably September that we're trying to get the Seattle, Jonathan's group has already said that he would participate. Bellevue, Portland, San Francisco, and Los Angeles building departments. KPFF, MKA said they would play in the game. Uh, Gutierrez playing, and I'm looking for uh, possibly Dagan Globe out of San Francisco to try and come up with what should the peer review process be for. You have a four story building that's outside the code, probably has a different review requirement than a 40-story building outside of the code. And uh, so that project, the grad student's getting his feet wet in, the, in an internship that's actually a design internship for a change. And uh, then he's starting that in the fall and trying to pull that together and get a policy that the West Coast of the whole can say, this is what we're going to do the review of these type of buildings. So Seattle's sweet spot is 24 stories, 240 feet, kind of the zoning area. Okay. Yeah. Ironically, there's a there's a building going into Vienna right now that's 24 floors. Yep. Yeah, I don't know where the breaks will come. You know, that's up to the advisory panel, kind of, that we're going to try and mm -hmm. play the mediating party between all this and see if we can't get a policy that then people can understand up front what they're up against. And if we get those main cities to it, most of the other cities will follow suit. And so that that's one that. We, I'd have the student already agreed to do this project and we starting to get people to buy on to do it. I'd like to get a couple architects in to make sure that we get both fire and structure into the scheme. So. Any other questions? You talked about like the tall wood advisory committee kind of coming out with recommendations in 2018. I mean, what's like a realistic timeline for seeing all wood buildings in Seattle. I mean, is well, it after that, it's going to just kind of fall into place, or? Well, I've got two that we're actively pursuing already through the city. Um, and let me just say, under 30 stories. Yeah. And keep it, <laughs> keep it there. Um, and higher than, than 12 stories. So in that range, we've got two that we're pursuing. And it's one of those things I think it's it's going to add the 12 months. It's going to add the 12 months as an alternative means and methods, and because those are so far outside of even what the tall tallwood ad hoc committee stopped it. Do you remember? I think 18. Was it 18? Yeah. It was 18. Yeah. So they stopped at 18, which is okay. It's fine. It's somewhere somewhere to start with. Right. Um, but the projects I'm working on are outside of that too. So it's going to okay. Well, you know, what do we do? So that's going to be a different process. But I think. Um, we got some projects up on Capitol Hill that would be in that you know six to eight story range, and I think the city of Seattle could, would rapidly adopt those. There's some low hanging fruit that's pretty easy to get to. I think this taller stuff is it's going to take a lot of time. And also, that tall wood building recommendation that then have it'll go through all the arguing. Let's call it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Before I mean, it becomes a document that you can be on <laughs> discussion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what, if you can talk about it, what kind of a client or program can just say, yeah, I'll battle the city for 12 months? I mean, if you can't, I, can't I mean, say. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, it's, I mean, so think of like, you know, just because we're here, I mean, think of like Microsoft or Google or one of those guys. Well, the other thing I was thinking, if, so you spend 12 months in negotiation with the city, right. but you can make it up on the construction end. Or being a market leader, being the, the first yeah. to, hey, we've, we've done the tallest wood building in the United States. Or someone who put, put knows they're going to do on more than one. Yeah. I mean, someone who knows that they're going to do more than one down the road. Yeah. 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 I got one guy. Have you been speaking with any jurisdictions in the region other than Seattle and Portland? Yeah. I mean, actually, funny enough, Bellevue uh, has been very good uh, to work with. Um, we've got one up in um, Mount Lake Terrace, the tall one the top of Mount Lake Terrace, and they were just kind of like, yeah, we'll, we'll look at it. And, how, how do we do this? You know, Tacoma's so, been very friendly. Yeah. Um, and they just like to leap ahead of Seattle, I'm sure. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's a couple, a couple of cities that want to do that. Um, I mean, even, even in Portland, funny enough, I mean, so Portland's, you know, we're moving forward there, but we've done Beaverton, Hillsborough, and uh, now we're doing the tall one in Eugene, Oregon, so. And that, uh, the Eugene one's only six, but I mean, again, it's outside of Any other questions? Well, thank you all for uh, being here. Thanks for and, having us. Uh, thank you, presenters. Appreciate it. Thank you.